This week's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have, life can be pretty damn hard. And without a healthy mind, it's even harder. Check out online therapy with BetterHelp.com slash awful and be on your way to a little more ease. Yeah, but Ma talks him out of it. She's like, oh, come on. It's Easter morning. Don't kill your son on Easter morning. He's like, all right. Just only because you browbeat me into it. He was supposed to do it two days ago. (laughs) (laughs) If you didn't get that shit on Friday, you just don't get that shit. It's too late. (laughs) God awful. Movie, movie, movie. Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because we somehow can't help it. I'm your host, No Illusions. Unfortunately, Heath can't join us this week because he's still in the past, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm wearing moon boots, Noah. Are you? I mean, I could be, because I, I, we're recording this in the future. Oh, I see. I think of moon boots as a thing from the past, <laughs> since that's when people wore moon boots. But all right. <laughs> this podcast needs to be quick. I am hanging upside down. Oh, no. All right. <laughs> so also joining us today is our soup-scented expert from the Naked Mormonism podcast, among others, Bryce Blankenagle. Bryce, it must be Mormon movie month. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic to be here. And fantastic to smell my smells i've just given into it you know what i can't fight this anymore you gotta embrace I it just, soup smells I, good at least it was a good okay. thing it's okay to smell like soup it's okay bryce exactly bryce after a year of trapped in new jersey i can't wait to be drugged by you before a live show again <laughs> oh every night for allegedly. a year my friend allegedly <laughs> uh, i can't wait to drug you again Awesome. Yes. <laughs> and also joining us, you may have detected another laugh for a god awful movies debut is Bryce's co host on the Glass Box podcast and another genuine Exmo, Shannon Grover. Shannon, welcome to God Awful Movies. Hi. I'm over here trying not to fangirl all over the place here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll do my best. I feel that way about Bryce too. It, yeah, I know. I feel that way about Heath, but luckily he's not here. So yeah, well, that's why we have to keep the two of you guys separated. We know what happened last yeah. time. You, <laughs> you drugged Eli to try to get him out of the way. It was a whole thing. It really it was a whole the thing. Yeah, show. allegedly. <laughs> Gonna have a talk with Andrew. All right, so distract us from that and tell us, Bryce, what will we be breaking down today? We watched the work and the glory which is a historical fantasy movie, which includes <laughs> a lot of work and absolutely no glory. Well, there you go. Yep. Yeah. It, it's weird that most of the work was on us, you know, the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and most of that work was, what is going on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the entire movie is about people picking things up and we did all the heavy lifting. It's crazy. So, Eli, <laughs> how bad was this movie? Well, If you love watching someone lose at three card money, but you wish the guy tossing the cards talked more about how everyone is bigoted against three card money throwers, (laughs) you (laughs) will love this movie. It's um, Con Air, My Grievances. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And when we have extra guests, I have to come up with extra questions. So here's one. Shannon, how Mormon was this movie? Oh, let me see. Let me see. Okay, look through the checklist. The bad guys drink alcohol. Check. Yes. Good guy beards are under the chin. Yes. <laughs> Joey's story gets repeated 27,000 <sighs> times. <laughs> check. Women only get to think for themselves when it's what their men says to think. Double check. Yeah, it's it, it's 100% Diane the Wool Mormon. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, look, the, the movie was boring, expensive, and entirely lacking in diversity. So I thought I was setting you up there, but I, I didn't want to presume. <laughs> All right. So, so now, like, in my experience, which is depressingly large, we've done a lot of Mormon movie months at this point. Mormons have four stories, right? The actual Book of Mormon, which is terrible. I was near Joseph Smith once and I nearly came, which is terrible. I'm on a mission and I'm desperately trying to maintain my faith despite my religion being so obviously wrong. And Saturday's Warrior. Uh, This movie (laughs) was of the second type. Yes, it was. Oh, my. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? 
best worst tree stump removal. You have so <laughs> much of that in your notes. Jesus. <laughs> Couldn't they have tried to find out how to do it right? I mean, how hard would it be? This production company is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. They could have gone to the Utah Pioneer Museum and seen actual equipment from the actual fucking time period. I mean, they could have gone to the Wheeler Farm to see the equipment. They're, okay. All right. We'll get to it. <laughs> this has been all week for me oh, all I'm, week I'm hearing sure. Shannon's rants about the tree stump removal it has been a remarkable experience oh my I've God. never seen the word tree stump in so many so many places in the notes yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing so that really got under your skin in a way that I gotta say I was I'm I'm surprised I, I saw your notes first and watched the movie I expected it to be a much bigger part of the film hey Hey, hey, it was a big part of the film. <laughs> My husband is a horticulturist who has over 20 years experience working with trees. I forced him to watch that scene. Mm. And and then he asked me for a divorce. Yeah, ruined the marriage right there. Yeah. <laughs> this would not that would not be the first marriage that this show has ruined, actually. So, OK, yeah. <laughs> I was going to go with best worst old timey words, right? Okay, because <laughs> like there are certain archaic turns of phrase that Mormons expect to hear in their movies. Right? Like, like Joseph Smith didn't see two persons, two people. He saw two personages, right, in the clearing. <laughs> but like other than those specific phrases, all the characters just speak normal contemporary English. So it's like they keep forgetting they're in a period piece and there's a guy <laughs> waving his arms off screen or something about it. Come on, <laughs> little house on the prairie. We talked about this. Come on, guys. <laughs> Would it kill you to throw in a the? <laughs> the Book of Mormon was uh, not the script writer for this show. <laughs> I had the best worst high stakes extreme sports. <laughs> now, we're going to get into this and probably spend a little bit too much time on it, if I'm honest. But there's a really steamy scene where the antagonist challenges Joseph Smith to... Um, a friendly little game, but the honor of an entire family rests on the outcome of this challenge. It is epic. Dun, yeah, dun, dun. we'll yeah. get to it when we review the movie, but I've jerked off other dudes with less intensity <laughs> than this one-on-one <laughs> -on -one sport thing. It's pretty important. And less homoeroticism. In Way yeah. less homoeroticism. <laughs> I was just being neighborly. Oh, my God. And I'm going to go with best worst bad guy mockery. Now, look. We've had some amazing bad guy mockery on God Awful Movies, thanks to the fact that Christian cinema doesn't let its actors swear. But in this movie, all the bad guys will do is say the beliefs of the Mormon religion, and that will make them the villains right. of the movie. <laughs> yes. I mean, they'll say I'm sneery, but yeah, that's all they ever say. The sneery with beards. Well, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Unkempt beards. Yeah. And dirty teeth. As I, I was trying to re figure out, was the director even self-aware on this? I mean, was he very <laughs> aware at all of what he was actually doing? Right. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We've got a lot of history to ignore on the other side of this break. So we're going to keep it brief. When we come back, we'll dive into all the tedious family drama that is the work and the glory. Hey, Lucinda, what are you doing in this ad? You're not in this episode. It's a get ahead, Noah. We're all in it, and we all aren't. Oh, wow, that's deep. But I'm here to talk to you about something you don't think about often enough, mouthwash. Yeah, I guess a lot of people don't think about mouthwash, but wait a second, you mean me specifically? Mouthwash is the perfect finishing touch to a complete oral care routine, but those huge bulky containers take up way too much room on the countertop. And that's why the folks over at Quip, the makers of the electric toothbrush and floss we rave about all the time, launched a new mouthwash to help you complete your clean. Plus, it comes with a refillable dispenser that's delightful to use and sleek enough to fit on any bathroom counter. <sighs> Man, kind of, kind of cabbagey, I yeah. guess. That's right, Noah. It is. But Quip mouthwash kills bad breath germs, helps prevent cavities, and leaves you feeling fresh thanks to a formula that gives your mouth everything it needs and nothing it doesn't. Their four times concentrate has fluoride, xylitol, and CPC. But they left out the artificial colors and stinging alcohol you'll find in a lot of other rinses. And Quip's refillable mouthwash isn't just good for your mouth. It's good for the planet. With a four times concentrated formula, Quip ships less water 
and more good for you ingredients. Each eco friendly refill replaces a big, bulky 470 milliliter bottle from one of those other brands once diluted. And Quip's refill bottles are made from 100% recycled plastic. Huh. I'm honestly just one great offer away from trying this out. Well, if you go to getquip.com slash awful5 right now, you can get $5 off a mouthwash starter kit. That's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90-dose supply of Quip's four times concentrated formula at getquip.com slash awful5, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash awful5. Quip, the good habits company. All right, everybody, it's time to get to work on our big historical epic about the life and time of Joseph Smith. Hooray! Now, of course, keep in mind, we're aiming for three movies here. So let's really capture the grandeur of the prophet, you know, so especially in this first one, his origins in Palmyra, New York. Oh, Oh, what's the what? What? Oh, Uh, mm, it's just that his origins in Palmyra are that. Like literally everyone hated him and was either conned by him or knew he was a con man. Right. Well, we could tell the story of the people he conned then. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we could. It's just that pretty much everyone he conned eventually testified very openly that he was a con man and that they lied to help him. So I I just think if we're going to make a big historical epic, that's going to. All right. Fine. Fine. I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll just stick to the part where they don't find out he's a big con man and hate him yet. That's like three years. Well, less, actually. Okay. Yeah, if you count the whole thing. All right, so, so, so less of an epic historical drama and more of like a, a movie about people who meet Joseph Smith and like, you know, he, he seems nice at first. Yeah, I, I guess that works. Yeah, it's like, it's like Act 1, the movie. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. Act one, the movie. All right, now who's up for some marshmallow squares? Ooh, yeah, me, 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 and we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up hovering over the cat skills back in 1826. How long does it take for me to doubt this movie's authenticity? Well, it's rated PG for drug use, foul language, sexual content, and violence. I'm like, no fucking way. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> if we get one of those four, I'll be surprised. I was, Yeah, I was like, are we going to have Emma see Catching Joseph with Fanny Alger in there? <laughs> <laughs> or is, are we going to find Joey doing shrooms? Well, right, yeah, whatever the fuck he was eating when he had those visions of the woods. Yeah, there you go. Oh, see, that's the, ver- the version of got off of movies where Noah's defending Joseph Smith. He's just like, look, he found them. They're his. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are assholes. This joke guy might have been onto something. I'm rereading all of them. <laughs> all right. So we join a family that's headed for Vermont to Palmyra, New York. Why? <laughs> okay. And no, my question wasn't why. My first question was what in the hell is a rock farmer? <laughs> you like plant them as little pebbles and mature them and water them and hopefully they'll one day grow up and to be a seer stone how does this work <laughs> so they make great pets they make great pets but yeah and also we, we have a narrator here who is the the eldest daughter of this family that's moving from Vermont there is no fucking reason for her to be the narrator right she will barely be a character this is Melissa I am in this movie as much as Melissa is. <laughs> but she doesn't want to move. She has the big gaw kind of moment about moving, but they move because you know yeah. she's a woman. It's 1826. What the fuck is she going to do? Right? right. So my appearance note for the dad is he looks like the love child of Liam Neeson's and Harrison Ford. And he's just running around the town. The Mormons, they took my wife. I've got a certain set of skills to get my daughter back from Joey Smith. <laughs> so, yeah, so we get the the work in the glory title card and then we do the old timey covered wagon. Go west, young man, but not that far west. Just a little, a little scooch, a little scooch and west. What I love about this is that this is an upstate New York montage, a.k.a. This is the best we can make this part of the country look. And we probably didn't even shoot it here. No, nope, they, <laughs> they shot it in Tennessee. 
Yeah. Oh, did they? Exactly. Right? <laughs> uh, Eli and Heath's hometown, where we have trees. End of list. Please yep. move on. Please <laughs> yeah. <move> on. <laughs> what I got bugged at is they ripped off the music from Silverado for this. Yeah. I was like, that's just rude. It's a better movie. <laughs> well, so was everything else. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. That's true. <laughs> but this scene is kind of interesting, though, because it just starts out, and Mr. Steed, Papa Neeson's, he's sharpening an axe. Mm-hmm. And there's this ominous yelling from the woods, Mr. Steed! Mr. Steed! And my thought was like, you changed the background music, and this is a completely different movie. Right? <laughs> I mean, it turns yeah. out it was just his family, like, who followed him for Vermont, but like, I kind of am liking the way that it could have gone. It's so weird because like throughout this movie, like you keep expecting something to happen and it doesn't because nothing ever fucking happens in this movie. So you keep thinking like, oh, this is the scene where they found his family murdered at the edge of town. No, just as just they just got there. They just got there. (laughs) Ma, we made it from the end of the montage. Okay, great. Well, and what I love about this movie and and I think this is a nice like framing to put on this entire film is that this is basically the first idiots Joseph Smith conned the three <laughs> <Yep>. movie epic, <laughs> right? This is patient zero of the Joseph Smith play. <laughs> yes. Right. yes. Yeah. And like, look, the actual historicity of this, which Bryce could go into much better, is just like, I don't know, we were fucking rock farmers and Joseph Smith was like, you guys want to join my religion? And we were like, sure, man, everyone dies at 30 fucking two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now they have to make the Lord of the Rings out of that. So... <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yep. They'll take their dramatic tension wherever the fuck they can get it, damn it. <laughs> I didn't know who those people were for a second. <laughs> oh, but this is also where this is where we meet Martin Harris, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh Martin Harris, he looks like everybody's drunk uncle mashed together in some kind of upside down universe. I'm just calling him yes. Uncle Vern the whole time. Okay. Yes. All right. I thought he was actually a really good choice because his eyes in particular just have that look of, I am too easily convinced about every little fucking thing you say to me. And so, yeah, <laughs> I'm the perfect foil for Joseph Smith. I will do whatever the hell you want. Tell me where to bend over, when, and I'm set. Well, that's what I love. Martin Harris is that weird friend of your dad's who wandered into your home every three months being like, I bought a bunch of kiwi fruit and you can have it for $500. Yep. <laughs> and like, let's get right. That is exactly who Martin Harris was and who he will be in the film. So I was loving him. Yeah. I was oh, yeah. loving mm-hmm. him. Yeah. Not so smarty Marty. Yeah. There we yeah. are. That's him. All right. So they find their way to their new property in Palmyra and then they fucking chop trees to steal guitar for a few seconds. <laughs> and seriously, they should have had warning to headphone users here. I would have appreciated that. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. They, okay. they, it was like they discovered their headphones were halfway plugged in at this <laughs> point and plugged them all the way in for the rest of the movie. <laughs> now, okay. We need to talk about this. <laughs> All right, Shannon, let's be a honest. On this next scene, do we? <laughs> yes. Let's be honest with our audience. You need to talk about I this. I need Shannon. to talk about this, and you need to verify it. Okay. <laughs> For one, at least chop the fucking tree right. They keep they have like five different cuts on the way up the tree. That's such a waste of fucking energy. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Those are horses, not mules, for starters. Older brother. Looks like an angry vampire to me on this. And okay. he's being played as the bad guy <laughs> on all of this yeah. thing. But he's the only one who's looking at things like a normal person. So they have this tree that they chopped down. Then they have another stump that's supposedly the stump for that tree they just chopped down. The tree they just chopped down was about one-fourth the size of the stump yes, they're showing. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so then they have chain wrapped around it. So they pull the stump out because Pa says there's not going to be any stumps in my field. This chain is an unwelded chain. And so you watch this thing as they're pulling it with two horses, not mules, two horses. So they, two they horses. They say mule over and over again. But yes, those are definitely fucking horses. Those are horses. Yes. And <laughs> this is an unfucking welded chain. Why the hell are they using this? This thing looks like it's got the strength to hold a chandelier over my kitchen table. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this, the tree itself is literally strong. One root of that fucking tree is literally stronger than that chain. My weak ass Hyundai accent has more horsepower than these horses do to pull this chain. <laughs> yeah. And then the chain flipped. 
Do you know what makes a chain flip? It's because there's stored energy in it. A steel cable will flip like that. Yes, there's stored energy in there that will, when it breaks, it flips it out. That chain doesn't have enough energy stored in it. When all of those links break, because every single one of them is stretching, all it will do is slither around the thing and follow the horses as they walk away. <laughs> no. And then that the chain goes and breaks this little sapling tree. That's a sapling in New York. It's not going to break it. It's going to bend it. But I'm like, Dude. <laughs> Dad sends him out to get a decent chain. I'm like, do you even know what a decent chain is? You're using a chain that's not even welded. I know better than that. Holy shit. And we should point out that, like, this is a three and a half minute scene. Yeah. And it is. Well, one time we were trying to get a stump off of the farm and it, it the chain broke and it almost got me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that like, made nope. it into the movie. And no, not only did it make it into the movie, but it earned a fucking slow motion dive roll. <laughs> yeah, it was like this really important thing. And, it was, and, and yeah, angry vampires over there going, yeah, just two inches away, dad. And I'm like, of what? Your family jewels? You got a bunch of kids. It's, it's going to matter if you lose those things. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> fucking Mormons. But luckily, this this stump becomes like the inciting incident of the show because this is when they learn about the Smiths. Right. See, that's why it's important. Yep. Bryce, Shannon, very important question. When you watched this movie as children, which I am assured that you did, did you applaud when they first said Joseph Smith's name? You have to tell me. It's like being a cop. <laughs> it came out when I was 37. Does that count? Yeah, like that's yeah, going to be a little tough. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But so they can't get the stump. They, they finish trying to fucking coax the stump out with a box of treats or whatever the hell they're doing. And they're like, oh, we can't do it. We don't have enough strength. And this guy, Martin Harris, that's helping him out. He's like, well, you know, I have a buddy who's got two boys that could help you. And they're like, really? What's their names? And he goes, Smith. And then everybody <laughs> in the theater stands up and cheers and screams like fucking Spider-Man just showed up or whatever. Yeah. yeah, the music they did there, they was I was like, dude, you guys failed on the music there. You're supposed to have a really good music cue. That's the this. crescendo. Yes. Yep. They missed yep. it. Yeah. yeah. One quick note here. This is a point that they I feel like they made a decision in the screenwriting process because Nathan, the good steed, gets chastised by his older brother, Joshua, the bad seed, the angry vampire, because he's reading a book while they're out working yeah. <laughs> to clear this land for the farm. He's, he brought a book with him and he's just reading there. And his brother's yeah. like, them book learnings can't get you far out here in this country. Like, Well, so, oh, I, God. We should point out, okay, so yeah, that's the key to this scene, right, is that we're going to meet the two brothers, Joshua Steed and Nathan Steed. And for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes of this movie, we're just going to go through a, like a series of Goofus and Gallant style vignettes showing us that Nathan <laughs> is a good guy, but Josh is a bad guy, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh my god! They have to create stakes somehow because right, otherwise yeah. there is. Do isn't. they? Do they really though, Bryce? <laughs> All right. So yeah, so Josh heads to town for a good old chain fixing, and this is where we also meet his well, everybody's love interest. The you know what the young female character who is the shopkeeper's daughter by the name of Lydia. Lydia McBride. Yeah, what bothered me here, though, is that they skipped a whole hell of a lot of stuff because everybody's already met already. Right. So Joshua's in the wagon with somebody. We don't know who the hell he is. Nope. He's already met Lydia before, so the yep. reveal of Lydia in the store doesn't make any sense. The meet cute happens off camera? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, granted, these books, I mean, I was working at BYU Bookstore when these books were coming out, and they're huge. Each one of them, and there's nine books in the entire series. This oh, is only Jesus. book one. Yeah. And, and it's the size of the Lord of the Rings trilogy in one book form that which also includes the appendices. That's how big the first book each book gets. So I'm like, how much did they skip? I mean everybody skips to put stuff on film, yeah. but I'm like, are they trying to entice you to go read the stupid book? Is that why they missed out on, you know, three fourths of the book putting it on film? What's the deal here? <laughs> well, I, I have like and what's amazing is that nothing ever happens in this movie. Right. Like, so like, yeah. there's so much that you could have cut to make room for that. Right. Now, so in addition, though, to going and getting the chain and meeting Lydia, this is also where Joshua Steed is going to pick up the hired help that his dad set up. That would be Joseph and Hiram Smith. 
Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and yes. where we finally get the sexual tension in the film. <laughs> <laughs> that we so sorely between, <laughs> between Joseph Smith and any other character appearing. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, there is more sexual chemistry between Joseph and Hiram than there is with anyone else. Yes. Oh, God. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean, Joseph would really fuck Hiram. So I get it. I get it. <laughs> Historically speaking, we know. Yes. Hiram, yes, Hiram is absolutely merry. From the Lord of the Rings. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. All right. Yep. And Joseph Smith is just a straight up honk. Like he's got, yes. I, I mean, he's a himbo with shoulders that you could store a wagon in. Like he's <laughs> a big boy. And fun fact, the actor, Jonathan Scarf, non-Mormon, and he has aged like the devil's cut. I oh would pull God. sticks with that guy all fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I sent Bryce pictures of him when we were watching this because I was like, yeah, he looked better in Equalizer too. He looks much <laughs> better in that one. <laughs> but, yeah. Hey, I just love no matter how many Mormon movies we watch, Mormons will always find the <laughs> most handsome, least realistic actor to play Joseph Smith. <laughs> Joseph <laughs> Smith. Looked like the shrinky dink that didn't quite make it out of the oven, but they hire fucking Henry Cavill to play him every fucking film. No, I I, I wrote in my notes here, like, if we ever do the Mormon movie month bingo card, comically fuckable Joseph Smith will be the center square. (laughs) Absolutely. For sure. He's just inventing Pilates with his 12-pack abs in the corner. Yeah, right. Come on! (laughs) (laughs) And it's interesting to watch, too, here, because... This is the time in the script where the actors stopped giving a shit about trying to do (laughs) old timey accents even. Yeah. And you can tell that this is where they kind of gave it up. So like the scene in the forest, Joshua is chastising Nathan and making it sound very like old timey. But by this point, we're we're just talking like normal 21st yep. century talking. It's oh, like calling each other dude. Yeah, right. Do either one. Like, choose a fucking century. It's like shitting in the woods and then wiping with three shells. It's just <laughs> choose which place you're going to live. It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so, so we head back to the house with Joseph and Hiram. And I love this scene so fucking much. So apparently they've, they've been working out in the field all day. And Ma's prepare a dinner and they just can't stop talking about how lazy Joseph Smith isn't. What a hard, <laughs> hard worker he is. Why oh, he God. would he could make so much money as a laborer, I'm sure. <laughs> and again, it's just I love it so much because here's the thing, okay? The Bible, however much historicity you want to put behind the Bible, and I don't want to get into that argument, <laughs> we don't have like a hundred signed affidavits that Jesus's carpentry shop was like child slavery. <laughs> and so Mormonism has just gone the exact opposite way. And they don't have to, right? They never have to do this. There's always a scene in a Mormon movie where some Mormon was just like, and then Joe made the best mashed potatoes we ever tasted. <laughs> yes, he's your yes. fucking prophet, dude. No one, there's no part of the Bible they were like, and all of his chairs were great. By the way, just in case you're wondering, <laughs> Jesus's chairs were great and affordable. Oh, God. Yeah. So but then that this is where we get the fucking we get Bryce's best worst. We get the stick pulling scene. Oh, okay. so <laughs> can we can we take some time here? Well, so <laughs> let me just say very quickly, I absolutely am going to be playing stick pulling. I guess we're going to have an intra P-I-A-T stick pulling championship now just so that I can watch Heath and Andrew do this and Heath and Eli do this. I just want to watch Heath throw people over his shoulder with this game. It's going to be so much okay. fun, even if I have to sacrifice myself. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, moving into the past a little bit, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is set up that Joshua Steed is a champion stick puller in Rutland, Vermont. Yes. And Papa Steed, Papa Neeson's, is like, well, let's show these Smith boys what Vermont stubborn really means. It's like the Smiths also grew up in Vermont, idiot. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But the thing is, Joshua, he's just a little too skinny to be a good stick puller, at least my type, right? But Joseph, on the hand, on the other hand here. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd, uh, I'd like to have a little stick pulling competition. I mean, we, sure. <laughs> we pull sticks so hard, we might even break one. Okay? <laughs> and, you know, I'm watching this scene and I'm like, I bet Heath 
is like a really good stick puller. I feel like, like he'd be like, really good at it. Like the best. Like he's got the height advantage. He's got, you know, yep. lack of hair so he can dissipate the heat easier and <laughs> Ooh. Those big stick pulling hands. I bet he could pull his sticks against like a whole shipload of semen. All right. Okay. So- now <laughs> I have a question. And look, did I come to this scene? Of course. But I do have one criticism. <laughs> it's a best out of three match. And I feel like they kind of mailed in that first one, right? Because oh, yeah. it's like, I'll throw you. But the first one, he's just like, one, two, and Joe just sort of like pulls it too quickly. And he's like, ow, owie, my fingers, owie. And they're like, <laughs> <Yeah>. oh, <laughs> okay. I'm hoping the last two will be epic. <laughs> so for, for everyone who got a little too caught up in the innuendo description that Price gave us. So if you're not familiar, here's the game, right? Two people sit on the ground foot to foot both holding a big pole and they're both pulling on the pole, trying to pull the other person over top of them, which yes, it acts like that's the beginning of gay porn. It just doesn't deliver on the gay porn. Right. Yeah. But that's the game that we're playing. And Joseph Smith is just cleaning the fucking clock of this Vermont kid. But I got to say, you know, if I were to pull sticks with Heath, I wouldn't go to the side like Joshua did. I'd, I'd be like, whoops, oh no. <laughs> My sweaty body is laying on top of your mountainous chest and glistening pectoral muscles. Whatever <laughs> shall we do about this? Just laying there oh, listening man. to his heartbeat. I bet it sounds like a Mack truck <laughs> driving over a bridge. This mm. episode is going to be played at a trial. <laughs> No, no, Eli, Eli, they'll just use the outtakes. (laughs) So I do want to talk about one thing about this scene, though, which is that dad ends the family honor stakes way late to the stick pulling. He's like, how about a friendly stick pull? Absolutely. They get foot to foot and dad leans down and he's like, just so you know, if you lose this fucking stick pull, I will never speak to you again. I'm just saying, I kind of... No, halfway through it, after his son's already lost too, he's like, don't embarrass the entire family and bring shame upon our generations or anything. And Josh is like, really, Dad? Really? This is the time to add stakes, huh? <laughs> Oh, and and also, like, can we just acknowledge that this is literally a my Messiah could beat up your Messiah scene from the movie? (laughs) Fits. That's very fitting. Yeah. Oh, now I'm sad that Muhammad doesn't sit down after Joshua gets up. (laughs) Come, my friend. (laughs) All right. So, but yeah, Joshua loses the stick pulling, very embarrassed. But then he goes back to the shop to see Lydia some more. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Lydia's the love interest who we teased at the beginning. And for this scene. Lydia, hang on. Lydia McBride. Seriously. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for this scene, she is dressed as a couch. Yep. Yeah. I, I have her down as a <laughs> colonel in a pillow fight. <laughs> that, that girl has so much starch in her clothes. I was like, did, did, were her armpits raw by the end of shooting? Right. Because <laughs> the starch in these was just out of control. Yeah, it's like she was like, you know, paraplegic and they were propping her up with those dresses. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) The next scene we see FDR in the same dress. (laughs) Hello, just ready to address the nation. (laughs) Walking legs. Oh, God. No, don't leave him out in the sun. He'll rise. (laughs) So, so yeah, but so but she invites him to the big barn raising, you know, Mm -hmm. which is Mm. fucking party time. Yeah. Proper Mm, party. Yeah. And then Nathan shows up to pick him up and we realize that this is a love triangle because good brother Nathan also has hot the hots for Lydia. And I yeah. who the hell can blame him? Lydia is just Ooh, and let's also say parents are super unapproving. Yep. Yes. Of course. Mm-hmm. They're just angry. I mean, Nathan Nathan looks like a basset hound to me. So I mean, I just <laughs> Okay. I was like, Basset Hound, angry vampire, both want Lydia. Okay. Yep. And there's no sexual chemistry at all. Okay. The, nothing that rises to the Joseph and Hiram Smith chemistry. Nothing no. <laughs> whatsoever. I was like, holy shit. Play it right, guys. I mean, they, oh, God. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, this is where we meet the film's bad guys. Which you can tell they're bad guys because they have beards. Yes, right. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Unruly beards. The sign of a bad guy or a wise old man. So, and <laughs> and this is, of course, this is Eli's best worst. Right, because they just come by and say, "Hey, Joseph Smith, say any historical thing we know about you that would 
infuriate randoms passersby, wouldn't it? And he's like, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to yeah, play this uh, game. Let's not. Let's play a different game. You want a stick pole? And again, like. They do this weird half lie thing where they're like, oh, weird. Joe talks to angels and he's got a golden bucket waiting for him. And <laughs> we, the Mormons, are supposed to be like, he didn't talk to angels. He talked to God and Jesus about where to find <laughs> reclaimed plates of an ancient new Bible. Uh, but he did uh, talk to angels, though. I, yeah. Yeah. It was this white Native American boy angel with bare and well muscled chest and a yep. sheet that showed that he was. Wasn't wearing anything at all under yes, this. I that mean, is I'm like, guys, I told you this is gay porn. I, we've had stick pulling already. You would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Keep waiting for it to happen. They're just driving away. Joseph turns to her. I'm sorry, they didn't mention how delightsome those angels I saw were at all. So you yeah. probably think I'm pretty crazy, <laughs> but I assure you, they were very delightsome. Yeah. yeah. And this is where they kind of like. I don't know, put the Steed family through like the town's hazing process yeah. of learning about the Smiths. Because <laughs> it's like, ain't you heard about the gold Bible yet? Ain't Joe tell you about his gold Bible? And the Steeds are looking around like, what is the hell is this business about this gold Bible? What are you talking about? Obviously the newcomers. And then we get to watch both of them learning it from different people in town. And they learn the same things from different people. It's just a matter of like who's telling the story and right. who's receiving the story as mm -hmm. to whether or not it's the right version of the same exact events. Well, what I love, too, is, OK, apparently these bad guys in town are trying to c explain to the new people, hey, don't trust the Smiths. They have all of this nonsense beliefs of talking to angels and golden Bibles and shit. But instead of just explaining that, which they could do. Right. They could walk up and say, hey, did you know that this guy that you're talking to right now claims X, Y and Z? They go ask him about his gold Bible and his angels. And then they ask and he's like, oh, it's not. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's just a, a through a squirrel. Look at that squirrel over there. <laughs> yes. Exactly. To be clear, Joseph Smith does not go. No, because that's what his religion is about. Right. Right. Also. I should point out that the reason we have this scene in the movie is because Joseph Smith showed up to Palmyra, called a fucking huddle, was like, hey, everyone, I'm the newborn God. An angel has brought me a new Bible. They told him to fuck himself. And so he had to work as a ranch hand until a new guy came to town so he could slow play his God. <laughs> That's how this movie is telling us that yep. particular story. And we see the slow play con yes. play out. Yeah. I wanted to pick up on another detail in this. Why are the, and this is a recurring theme, these bad guys, and I'm just calling them the Murdoch boys, right? That why are the Murdoch boys so possessive of the gold plates? Right. Could it be that maybe Joseph Smith ran with these guys in treasure digs, but then stopped hanging out with them when he came up with the gold Bible story? Could it be? Yeah. Of course. Well, I also love that there's this weird, and we'll get to it later, but there's this weird combination of they don't believe in the gold plates, but they also want to steal them going on with the, uh, <laughs> yeah, with the, yeah. the yeah. second half of the movie. And Joe dismisses any questions about this by calling the guys jackasses. Con artists answer, yep. answer a question with a question every yep. single yep. time. Yeah. Well, and when he's, he's like, well, what, what were they trying to say? He's like, well, every time an ass brays, does that mean it has something to say? And he's like, no, but those were human beings using words, man. Like that doesn't, <laughs> yeah. you're just trying to. Can you just say you don't know any angels and they didn't tell you where gold plates are buried? Man. You know what's interesting <laughs> thing about hats? The interesting thing <laughs> that I can you can read scripture of. out of them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, damn it, damn it! I can't even go there. <laughs> so yeah, they go and remove the stump this time. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course they have the same chain. Yep, as before, unwelded again, and the Smith boys that are helping to push the fucking Trump out are standing on the roots that have to yes. come out of the ground. <laughs> yes. And I was like, why didn't somebody use a pole as leverage? That's usually how you do this kind of thing. But I was like, just because they pulled a tree out like this in Lord of the Rings doesn't mean that's actually how you do it. <laughs> and Lord of the Rings is self-aware. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. They wanted it to be more Lord of the that's Rings. That's it. I mean, yep. I mean, Lord of the Rings was just a few years before this. I mean, Lord yep. of the Rings is self-aware enough to know Know that they are fantasy and to play it that way. Yeah, they're orcs and urukai pulling them out, but they're also using fucking magic to do that. <laughs> this is, I'm like, it's, uh, okay. 
we can move on. <laughs> so, okay, so, but now we get the part where, because Nathan is the good brother, right? So Nathan has the whole Mormonism thing explained to him, right? So Joey and Hiram sit him down on their walk home, and we get a flashback of the whole Joe Smith being talked to by God and Jesus in the... God, I've mm -hmm. seen this on video 300 times now <laughs> in, different, <laughs> yeah. in different movies. Well, I loved watching this montage from my perspective of knowing that Joseph Smith is a con man, right? Because they show him in church and the voiceover is like, which religion was true? But if you just watch the video with the knowledge you have, you can see baby Joseph Smith being like, oh, shit, I can make my own religion up. Sweet. I'm going to get in on this con. <laughs> yep. This seems fucking Bingo. great. That's exactly how it worked then. Everybody yeah. was doing that. Yeah. Right, well, right. All, right, all yeah, this scene exactly. was missing was a, the passing around the collection plate. Right. Yeah. yeah. So little Joey in the voiceover is like, well, I checked out all the religions. And I'm like, yeah, except the ones that weren't Protestant Christianity. All the ones except. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the religions I wanted to start. Right. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> And it's such a cop out, too, because they show him out in the woods and then the light descending and then nothing supernatural. They don't actually show us anything. Nope. And much. they don't even include like part of the canonized version, which is like he was wrestling with Satan before and his tongue was bound and all that mm -hmm. shit. No, it's just the light appears and then flashbacks over. Right. Because yeah. the story's so fucking stupid that like goddamn Joseph Smith not answering the question on the ride home. This movie does not want to tell us the dumb shit in Mormonism. <laughs> right. <laughs> And it's also like the con men tag team. We got Hiram and mm -hmm. Joe working together and like, mm -hmm. you know, Joe tells the story and then Hiram's like, go search it out in your mind. And then they're doing the whole tag team one, two punch. And then when Nathan asks, what did God and Jesus look like? <laughs> Joe was like, glorious beyond description. So <laughs> I, wrote, I, I wrote my notes like, dude, I've read your book. All things are beyond description for Joey tight like <laughs> oh, a God, dish yeah. smith, okay? And you're not even as good at it as H.P. Lovecraft. Like, you just you suck, yeah. man. Yeah. This whole scene was so triggering for me because it took me back to being a missionary because all of that was exactly precisely the way you are on a mission. And I'm sitting there going, it's been 30 years since I was out on a mission and I still remember that fucking scripture word for word. No. <laughs> I had a pillar of light directly over my head above the bride and the sun. So does it How could you have, like, if you had a pillar of light above your head, you would just be seeing a circle. You would see a circle <laughs> yes, of light above your exactly. head. It doesn't even make uh, fucking sense. And why is he saying personages? Right. He's, uh, he's exactly. uneducated. That's not even what that word would ever have meant. Oh my God. And I was like, why are you telling the story that's the last one of the versions that you right, ever yeah, told? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> why is that the one you're telling Bassett Hound? And I love so, and then the, and he walks away. He walks off after the story, with, leaves uh, Nathan and Hiram. And Hiram's like, look, I know. That it uh, sounds like a bunch of bullshit, but like after he tells it like three or four times and you can kind of predict where it's going, it's, it sounds less stupid. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, this was a clinic for sure. If you're taking notes of how to start a cult, this here you go. Watch the show. Yep. And yeah, that's exactly it. Because here's the thing about Mormonism. Mormonism doesn't catch on that, you know, when they like to preach against that first you abhor, then tolerate, then love. They say that about sin. That's what it is about Mormonism. They figure they repeat the story enough yep. times to you. First you hate it, then you tolerate it, then you accept it. That's how brainwashing works. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so then we cut to the barn raising, the mayonnaise of parties. <laughs> and, and, and the whole scene here is supposed to be Josh and, you know, courting Lydia, but like, what he doesn't have the guts to go dance with her. He he wisses no out like a fucking chemistry. seventh grader at his first dance or something. <laughs> what was no, it's a church dance. It, it yeah. feels a lot like a steak dance for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and she like beckons to him to like, come, yeah, come yeah, over right. here. And, you know, she's around with like some townsfolk and they're like talking and laughing and everything. Mm -hmm. And he's like, nah, I'm gonna go hang out with the Murdoch men and get yeah. shit faced underneath where this I can get some sexual chemistry going. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> <laughs> Somebody with a real beer. And why do they always make a big deal? Mormons make a big deal about alcohol then. Everybody drank alcohol, then nobody drank water. Water was deadly. 
Joseph hadn't even come up with the word of wisdom thing. And I mean, he only did that because his wife busted him for what a mess they made there. And so then he also turned around and told her she couldn't drink coffee. So (laughs) it's like, I mean, it wasn't even made a law in the church until in the 1920s. No, I'm like, guys, be self-aware. Yeah, but but of course, to the modern Mormon viewer, that's just yet another way that we know he's the bad guy because he sneaks off and drinks alcohol. He gets Mm -hmm. drunk. Yeah. And cinematically, I get that they are presenting us the crossroads of character development. It's not. Nope. Like, it could be. (laughs) It could be done very well. They could have spent just, you know, another minute and a half in this scene to build up a little bit more time with Lydia and Joshua. No, no, this is nope. it's just his crossroads. And he's like, I'm going to take a big swig of moonshine. <laughs> yeah, right. No, he just gets to the crossroads and he doesn't even like slow down. And it's <laughs> you just <laughs> yeah. you as a viewer might not have noticed that was a crossroads at all. Yeah, yeah it's a turnpike yeah. of plot decision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Now, I will say the music was fun in that scene. I did okay. like that. Mm-hmm. That guy was playing the fiddle, not in time with the, the soundtrack, but he was playing it. All right. Which, you know, that's something I look for. I play the violin. I play oh, the right cello. On. I look at those things. <laughs> but yeah, that was that was cute and it was fun. And I was like, please let me and tell tell me if we're gonna have a plot finally, but at least the music's good. No, and, and to <laughs> and to as if to underscore how little of a plot we're gonna have. They have, like, when he goes and drinks alcohol with the Murdoch boys, they have the same goddamn conversation that every character has had for the last four scenes, which is, tell me more about that golden Bible thing. Yep. Right? We do that again. Yep. And now it's the bad guys uh, filling Joshua in on it. Yeah. Everyone gets Joseph Smith's backstory, but the bad guy gets it sarcastically. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he gets it with a bottle of whiskey in his hand. They're exactly. bad. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, if they'd only told the story once, this movie would have only been 25 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, speaking of telling that story again. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah. Here we go again. So now we, we cut to Easter morning. And Ma's sitting on the steps reading her Bible, right? Because Mom is a good character. And Nathan comes down early and talks to his mom about the Bible because he's a good character. Mm -hmm. Small detail. She's reading. She says she's reading the last part of John when Mary gets to the tomb. Just just a great part of the story. She's Mm -hmm. not holding a Bible. It's a pamphlet. It's a (laughs) leather-bound 30-page pamphlet. I don't know what she's reading. It's not the fucking Bible. She's got the serialized Bible. She's yeah, she's got just she got Adam she's Clark's Bible contrary. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and this is where the movie tries to wrestle with the like, why would anyone believe this shit? So he's like, hey, mom, do you think Jesus and maybe his dad show up to random fourteen year olds in the woods? And mom's like, I mean, it's possible. And he's like, well, no, it's not possible. And she's like, well. It could be possible. Well, yeah, like, she's well, like, no. well, yeah, that would totally fit with existing Christian theology. <laughs> that would. <laughs> uh, he might as well say, so you would find that very convincing, wouldn't you? Would you say he's, he's like putting the product in her hands, like Marvin's magic drawing board. <laughs> yeah. And I love how the mom tries to dissuade Nathan from talking about this because clearly it's the gossip of town and she's like, the steeds are above gossip. And I'm like, yeah, just like Heath is above everybody. Because <laughs> he's, he's real tall. He's, he's a tall drink of he's muscle tall. milk. I, I bet Heath could pull a California Redwood against Paul Bunyan. Mm. <laughs> we'll find out. There we go. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So, but yeah, and what I love the most about this scene is because like finally Nathan says like, let me tell you this story that Joseph Smith was telling me. And the idea here is that like just, you know, the camera's going to pan out and the sound's going to fade out and eventually the picture's just going to black out as he's telling mom the story. But they pan out for so goddamn long and the actor is basically like, we didn't prepare enough stuff for me to see here. <laughs> right, so you just have that stumbly uh, fade away that Christian yep. movies are so famous for. It keeps zooming out like it's on Google Earth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> They just start repeating the same line. So mom, what you reading? <laughs> we watch the camera fall off the track and some guy comes over and picks it up. <laughs> Alright, well I'll tell you what, for true act breaks you need some kind of plot type 
thing going on, and we're a long way from anything like that. So we're going to pause here, but we'll be back in a flash with even more boring white people in old-timey outfits. <laughs> Welcome home, Lucinda. Um, hey, Noah, and my extended family and friend group. What's going on? Well, we're having an intervention. What? What kind of intervention? A pumpkin spice intervention. Oh, come on! I'm not addicted to pumpkin spice. Oh, oh, really? What? What kind of coffee is that? It's pumpkin spice latte, but and and in the bag, pumpkin spice muffin. But and, I... and what were you chewing on when I walked in on you at three in the morning? An actual spicy pumpkin. An actual spicy pumpkin, that's right. Look, if you didn't like the macaroni and pumpkin spice last night, you should have said something then. But in my defense, it's hard to come up with something new to eat every single night. Well, that's why there's HelloFresh. What's HelloFresh? Oh, sure, throw the whole spreadsheet out of whack. What? Nothing. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. I don't know, Noah. That sounds pretty expensive. Actually, HelloFresh is over 30% cheaper than shopping at grocery stores with pre-measured ingredients that ensure you won't spend money on excess food that ends up going in the trash. Plus, HelloFresh offers the flexibility you need to easily customize your order on the app within minutes, easily change your delivery day, food preferences, and plan size, or skip a week whenever you need to. That does sound convenient. Not only that, but it's delicious. HelloFresh sent us some sample meals when they started sponsoring the show, and they were so good that I've been a customer ever since. Hmm. Can I? Undercuts the whole premise of the ad, huh? It's best if you don't think too hard about them. All right. I'm sold, Noah. How do I sign up? Well, just go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful14 and use code Awful14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Sorry, what was that website again? I was busy cutting up lines of pumpkin spice. Of course you were. It's HelloFresh.com slash Awful14. Use code Awful14 and get up to 14 meals free, including free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Also, don't cut up lines of pumpkin spice. Oh, good point. Key bumps will last longer. <sighs> well, 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 if it ain't Joseph Smith. Oh, now you leave us alone, Willie Willington. What? We're just talking here. Hey, Joe, you find them golden plates yet? Uh, I'll, I'll just be going. Now, Willie Willington, you know Joseph don't believe no such thing. Ooh, would you look at the time? Oh, yeah, because I heard he found the ancient scriptures written by the last group of a submarine traveling super Jew led by a magic compass. Oh, nonsense. That's just nonsense. D did you guys hear a fire bell? I, 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 th I thought I just heard a fire bell. And you know what else? I also heard he's going to use that magic compass, which he found in a different location told to him by a different angel to translate those plates from inside a hat. But if someone asks him to retell the story to make sure it's a real translation, he's going to get mad and make him do a different story. Well, I never, jo Joseph. Are you are you taking notes? No, what? What? Uh, th th that thing with the compass was really good. Okay. And we're back for more of this shit. When we last left our heroes, it was Easter morning and the insufficiently pious members of the family were trying to shake off that barn raisin hangover. <laughs> and we're going to rejoin that action, actually, with Josh uh, dunking his head. That's uh, angry vampire dunking his head in a barrel of water on the <laughs> homeward stumble. Yes. <laughs> and I love this scene only because as he comes out of the tank, he like looks a cow right in the eye and the cow's like party foul. Am I right? <laughs> Beer before liquor, my friend. Beer before liquor. It's <laughs> yes, so. a so very knowing look from the cow. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what are they trying to do? Create a comic relief there? I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That's the only comic relief we get the whole show. Oh, my God. Like if that cow had become his sidekick from that point on. Oh, like this, so much better. It was not oh. too late for this movie to redeem itself. I want that yeah. movie. Yeah. So, yeah, and then we cut back to the house and Pa, who also had a little too much to drink at the barn raising, he will not be Mormon by the end of this movie. Pa comes in. He says, where did Josh get home? She's, and Ma's like, well, Josh never did come home. He goes to leave. It's like, like he grabs his shotgun and goes to hunt him <laughs> down or something, right? I'll kill the man who wears a yellow shirt. Give me my yellow shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was like, how old is Angry Vampire anyway? What is he? he I mean, he looks like he's like 25. Right. Yeah. And this is 1826. So that's like 41 in today's years. Yeah. <laughs> 
And there is no explanation for why Pa is so mad. Yeah. There is no reason for him to be mad about Joshua not coming home. There's there's no stakes. There's no explanation. There's no character development to explain. There's no reason for this scene to right. go the way that it does. Nope. That's why I was like, I think we're missing like a fourth of the book at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Us lucky bastards. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but Ma talks him out of it. She's like, oh, come on. It's Easter morning. Don't kill your son on Easter morning. He's like, all right, just only because you browbeat me into it. He was supposed to do it two days ago. (laughs) (laughs) If you didn't get that shit on Friday, you just don't get that shit. It's too late. Meanwhile, Joseph, instead of going home, goes over to Lydia's and throws a few pebbles at her window, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Hey, sorry I missed you at the dance. I was drinking in the corner of a horse stall with guys who want to rob an angel. <laughs> <laughs> and she's actually pretty cool. She lets him know that she's she's going to stay with her aunt soon, and her aunt is a lot more lax than her very strict parents are. Mm-hmm. Which you can tell because her aunt smiles and her parents don't. <laughs> right, right. I kind of like, honestly, if they did a prequel that was just this aunt's story, because she was clearly a fuck machine the best. at some point, Hell right? Yeah. Oh, I feel yeah. like I'd watch that. I like we'll her. We'll get yeah. to her anyway. But yeah, but so Lydia says, hey, you, I got to go to fucking church because it's Easter Sunday, but go to my aunt's house on Wednesday. She'll probably let you fuck me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I do want to point out here, one of the things that the show did well was period correct windows. Yes. Pretty hard to do, but the windows, you can see they're like wavy and there are bubbles in it. That they, they, they got the windows right. At least they got that one thing right in this period era piece. I just, it, it blows me away that they got anything wrong because if there's one thing Mormons have in abundance, it's a bunch of dumb shit from 1826. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, like the, you know, you can find it in the Utah Pioneer Museum. Well, that's, yeah, I think you guys have whole little fucking towns in Utah for that shit. Anyway. Uh, yes. I want Heath to throw a boulder through my wall. Yes. <laughs> So back at the Steed house, uh, the youngins are reading Bible stories for Easter uh, when Joshua shows up, you know, all hung over and alcohol smelling and whatnot. Yeah. And in, in defense of this scene, you're an alcoholic. No, you're an alcoholic as a screaming fight is a proud upstate New York Easter tradition. So this is, this is, this is very meaningful. This is like my Chinese New Year, guys. I need you to respect this. You dress up as a dragon. Your dad dresses up as a dragon. You yell at each other. And mama chases the dragon. Yeah. See, what I wonder here is, does the director know that he's probably really writing about Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr.? I think so. Okay. (laughs) That's what I wanted to know. Because I was like, Sr. was a total alcoholic. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so was Junior. But I, I will say one thing I absolutely loved about this conversation with this argument that he has with his dad that Josh and, and Pa Steed have is that at one point he calls Murdoch, the, the bad guy with the beard, he calls him and his buddies tavern rats. And that's just a marvelous fucking term. I like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> It's like hemlock nuts. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But this is the final straw, and Joshua leaves the homestead. He's going to go stay in town with the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pop had to speak ill of the rich girl, Lydia, and Joshua just can't stand up for that. That's his girlfriend, damn it. Oh, that's right. We keep forgetting. Well, yeah, could could be his theoretical girlfriend. Yeah. And and like dad says basically, like, ah, yeah, but her dad thinks that she's too good for you. And he's like, how dare you? He's like, no, that's. We've established that that's like his, that's true. his dad's only <laughs> yeah. characteristic or her dad's yeah. only characteristic. Yep. Like, so. And also at this point, though, to play into the dad's character flaws, then Joshua tells Pop that he should fire the Smiths if he's yes. worried about the stink. Right. And yeah. that's going to be important because later on, he does fire the Smiths and then nothing else happens about that. Nope. Right. <laughs> exactly. <Yep. laughs> Well, but yes, again, so that him and his brother can be goofus and gallant. As he's walking out, he's like, also, I don't like Joseph Smith at all. And then he leaves. Right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, both of them don't care for Joseph Smith. So why are they fighting? 
It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Because, yeah, because then dad just in the very next scene, he's like, Joey, Hiram, here's your money. You're fired. And they're like, oh. Yeah. Damn it, we should not have won at stick pulling. What were you thinking? Yes. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> but that's true. That's true. Don't embarrass your boss's kid and, and stick pull. If only you weren't so good at stick pull, the Eli Bosnick story. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here like, just wait until Heath shows up. Then Palmyra will have a new stick pulling champion. Yes. Yeah, it, yeah. Oh, if that's all it takes to start a religion, Heath is going to be a fucking messiah when he grows up. Oh, works. fuck yeah. He could pull the trident from Poseidon's grip. There okay, we yeah, go. Man. All right. So then we again with the goofus and galant shit. Now that we've seen how terribly Josh does when he flirts with Lydia, we see Nathan showing up to see Lydia. Now he's not there Ooh. to flirt. He's just there to see if she knows where Josh is, but he'll you know, flirt. Well, he's got the opportunity, right? <laughs> now this is also where we meet the aunt. Yeah. Oh, I love the yes. aunt so much. Mrs. Gates. Okay, Mrs. Gates. Yeah. Yeah. So she's like, he shows up and he's like, oh, can I see, come to see Lydia? And he's like, oh, you Steed boys are just running a train on her this weekend, aren't you? And he's like, oh, <laughs> oh. oh that was the goal. So uh. I will say, the saying is guests and fish stink after three days, not guests and salmon. God. <laughs> <laughs> just that bugged me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, are, are there other fish that smell good after that, after yeah, being left exactly. out? For, <laughs> Yeah. Swedish fish. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Nope. I stand corrected. <laughs> Fair enough. Lydia was playing the violin there. I mean, she was a violin major and at University of Georgia, the actress was. So the, oh, really? the music guy, he wrote the piece for her to play for that. They said on IMDb that she played it on camera, but I, she's not playing the exact notes that they play. <laughs> she sure isn't. No. <laughs> and you can tell because the music she is playing doesn't go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so that was the funny thing. But yeah, she was. Murder fingering from Michael J. Fox. Yeah. Oh, come, on. come on. All right. Didn't we all? Uh, so, but Josh shows up while the two of them are flirting and you think, oh, brother fight. But no, that would require something interesting to happen. So Josh is like, oh, good. It's my brother. Did you bring me any cornbread or anything? He's like, yeah, yeah I got a whole yeah. saddle bag full of cornbread here for you. Right. And of course, Bassett Hound is like, hey, Melissa said you can have her warming stone if you come back. And I'm thinking, what, do they label their warming stones? They're just a stone. <laughs> they trade them out. Everybody has like 15 of them. That's what the fuck? No, my precious warming stones is. No, don't do it. <laughs> oh, God. And of course, they're all trying to pretend like there's this, you know, sexual chemistry between them. It's like. It's like watching Finn, Ray, and Poe in those Star Wars movies. I'm like, there was no chemistry with them either. Yeah. One thing I want to point out about this scene is why the fuck is Josh being portrayed as so shady? Right. Right. So he got in a fight with his dad and then left. Mm -hmm. He's like 25. I mean, he was long overdue for this anyway. Then he moved out on his own. Mm -hmm. He gives Nathan some money from the job that he has yeah, he's got a job. to help the he, family. He's working, yeah. Yes. He says that he's going to help with farm work for no pay, and he's courting the town rich girl. Like, what the fuck has he done wrong in this? I don't understand why he's the bad guy. He drinks alcohol and doesn't like Joseph Smith. Keep up, Bryce. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of which, speaking of which, the whole Joseph Smith thing comes up yet again here, right? <laughs> right? In the middle of the fucking everybody's flirting with Lydia scene, they bring up Joseph Smith and 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 the angels that he sees, and Nathan jumps to his defense. He's like, "Well, actually, he didn't say that he saw angels. He said he saw God and Jesus. That's way more sane. That happens sometimes." <laughs> and I'm just like, "Man, this is like every Mormon history conference I go to." Yes, it is. <laughs> See, repetition, repetition, yeah. then, you, uh -huh. then you believe. So meanwhile, Lydia's aunt, uh, Lydia's like sneaking out for the night and the aunt is being all wise and old timey and witty. <laughs> okay. I love this scene, not because anything happens in it or because it ever matters, but because all Ant will ever say for the rest of the movie is, you get some dick yet? Yep. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see my gentleman caller down at the Habit. All right, talk to you when you get some dick. God, so boring. I, 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 I loved it when she threw shade on the uncle. 
and just that. It's fun, and then it gets bland. And she yeah, just right. Looks Look at right at her husband the whole <laughs> oh time. Oh my yeah. god, that was the best. Fucking mic drop. It was great. <laughs> Uh, she's that like, you know, it's all great when you, and then he won't go down on you, the lazy fuck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not any fun. But also, but the aunt points out, she's like, you know, I'll tell you what, if I was your age, I'd be trying to fuck that Nathan boy, not that Josh. You know, he's the bad guy. He probably drinks alcohol and doesn't like Mormons. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was like, why? Why Nathan? Why him? I mean, he's a basset hound. They can't even make him act with the right kind of posture to look like he's thinking thoughts. You know, it's just he's this follower that follows around and hopes that the guy will look at him and oh god yeah he's a pup yeah he is absolutely a puppy dog and just a shadow of the show like yeah he could be portrayed by a where did the bad man touch me doll and <laughs> oh god, yes. the movie would be no different <laughs> yeah for sure for sure <laughs> but also i was like it's a good thing this isn't happening in england because at this time lydia would be so compromised off of all of this i mean just completely and be forced to marry somebody well, it's uh, it's about to get even worse, right? Because then yeah. Lydia sneaks out and she goes into the town slash haunted fucking house at a carnival <laughs> to see Joshua, right? Like she's walking through and like at every corner, there's somebody going like, "Ooh, I'm a bad town person," you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, this is a great scene because she shows up and pets Joshua's beard <laughs> and says, "What's this?" And he says, "Regressing from man to ape." Yeah. On the origin of species wasn't published for another thirty years after this interaction. <laughs> well, he was a cu cutting edge kind of a yeah. biological thinker. Of course, that makes him the bad guy. Yeah. Well, you know, he probably stared at. Sorry, I was going to do a like looked at a sword and figured out how to make one joke, but I couldn't think of what he would stare <laughs> at. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, I'm, I'm backing but off. But we do need to talk about Joshua's beard. We really because do. oh god, it is an eyebrow pencil. <laughs> <laughs> it is the this movie's stump removal of beards. Yes, it really yeah, is. I think, I think they microbladed that. I That's what I think happened. There is no real hair in this beard. It is all <laughs> eyebrow pencil. I, here's what I assume happened. The makeup lady went insane, tried to murder him a la Jason or Freddy Krueger with an eyebrow pencil and when he woke up from her murder fugue, he was like, hey, can this be my beard for the movie? And they kept <laughs> See now that no, what I think happened because he's an angry vampire. See, is they hair and makeup sent over somebody to microblade the beard on him because he just wanted to be tough, you know, and just have million cuts on him. But when the blood came out, his fangs came out. She freaked out, so he bit her, sucked her dry, and had to have somebody else come. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I buy it. Two buy competing it. theories. <laughs> Hashtag you decide. I'll tell you what, both of those are much more realistic as options than that's his beard. Oh right, like so. <laughs> if you put all three of those on the multiple choice, I ain't taking A. <laughs> I started screenshotting it and comparing them to see if they added any more in between shots. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but so, but she's come to see him now. Is, is he living in some giant warehouse at the docks? Apparently. He appears to be because he keeps trying to spruce the place up like it's a bachelor pad and yeah. you didn't expect to get laid. He's like, oh, you know, I, I sleep on a futon on the ground because it's good for your back. In Japan, they <laughs> yeah. uh, have half empty bowls of cereal all over every surface. No, no, no. Stacks of pizza boxes make great coffee tables. I promise. Yeah, they right. Do. No, it's, like, it's recycled. Well, and when the Murdochs come, she's like, oh, I can't be seen by anybody. And I was like, girl, you are being sexually harassed all the way down the street. And everybody knows you're the shopkeeper's daughter. Wait, like there's oh, 19 the people fuck? in this town. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fucking Palmyra in 1826. Everyone knows you're there. Yeah. yeah. And like, and she says that they like the Murdoch specifically can't know that she was there. Well, why? Yeah. Why? Like, yeah, we what, never establish a reason for that. What will that information give the Murdochs? The Murdochs hate the Smiths, not her. Yeah. yeah. Right. It would be so easy, but it would be so easy as a writer to add something here. Like, you know, they've been looking for a chance to blackmail me or whatever. It's something. But no, it's just they can't see me. Why? Because the script says they. God damn it. There's no why in this movie. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. Yep. 
Next scene. Next scene. Real quick. Go. Right. Yeah. Well, OK. Well, we just saw a scene of Joshua goofing his way about romancing Lydia. How about a scene now of Nathan galanting his way into romance? <laughs> oh right. Because the, the very next goddamn scene is him at the fucking shop saying, hi, lovely Lydia. Could I buy some candy for you to give to oh poor God. children? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and she's all, can you move this over here? And I was like, he flipped his line. He was supposed to say, as you wish. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah, he was. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah, he was. Yeah, so he lifts some things for her all gentlemanly like and buys some candy for fucking orphans or whatever. By the way, she just reaches into the fucking jar with her filthy ass hands to get the candy oh, that's God, going God. Where yeah. was her mask? Ugh. Watch this. <laughs> Holy shit. Also, like we me. get a soft light filter for these shots just yeah. for her, not yep. for Nathan. No, oh, you're right. We do. I liked it. I liked <laughs> it. To be fair, if you softened the light around Nathan, he would melt into the background. <laughs> <laughs> He is a, if, if soft lighting were a person, it's Nathan. I get it. <laughs> Hands were tied. And of course, once again, as he's flirting with Lydia, Josh shows up all, you know, drunkardly and unshaven and tavern yes. rat ask. And of course, it's got to be as cheesy as humanly fucking possible. So the conversation that Josh has with Nathan is Nathan's like, gee, Josh, I sure hope you'll show up at home for Ma's birthday. The whole family sure does miss you. And Josh going like, whatever. I hate Joseph Smith, by the way. I thought I'd add that. <laughs> In case we hadn't mentioned that. But I don't give a shit about Mom's birthday. And then the scene ends with Joshua, like Nathan turning and leaving the store and Joshua like squaring up in front of Lydia. It's like, oh shit, this is going to be like the lovers quarrel that like ups the ante, increases the stakes, right? No, camera cut. Nope. <laughs> next scene. Hurry, next scene. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Yes. Yeah, no, This because that would be too spicy for this jello mold of a fucking movie. Wow. Yeah, they, wow. they already get did what they're supposed to do in each scene, which is talk about Joseph Smith. Yeah, he's done, yeah. so you got to move on to the next one. Oh, speaking of which, I love this scene too because right because Nathan leaves. Oh God, the, <laughs> this is maybe the best scene in the whole movie. It is my favorite. Nathan leaves the shop, and he runs into Emma Smith, and when he meets Emma Smith, he says. He might as well just go, oh, Emma Smith, Joseph's only wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When she introduced herself, I wrote in my notes, Joseph's wife, bruh, which one? That's like saying Eli's internet enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were like, cue the South Park's theme here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Nah, dum, 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 dum. Okay, we're going to sing that the rest of the time. So he's walking with uh, Emma Smith. They're walking across town. And then the whole town starts to gather up to, you know, throw apple cores at her and chant more men, more men about how disgusting and terrible her and Joseph yeah. Smith are. And, yes. and they're like accosting her like, oh, see any angels? Uh, angels help with the housework. Uh, angels uh, shuck the corn for you. And it's like that. All they're doing is just like repeating the shit that Joe has told people. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, none exactly. Of it, none of it is a departure from the story as it stands. That's yeah. ridiculous. Okay, so now it's time to see some more of the good old Joseph Smith con artistry. So we get the scene where Nathan goes to see Joey to learn more about these golden Bible visions and shit. Yeah. And it, I, I love the opening of the scene too, because he shows up at the Smith house and like there's just like this increasingly aggressive series of people trying to give him pie as he's like, no, I, really can't. <laughs> yeah. I can't South stay. Park, there we are oh. again. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, This is so Mormon too. It, it is, is so Mormon. Right. They captured yeah. it so well. This would be done so much better if this were satire and they were making yes. fun of Mormon culture. Instead, they just captured Mormon culture perfectly because it's made by a bunch of milk toast fucking Mormons. But yeah, right, right, right. They're like, what would they? They'd offer a pie. I would say they'd make yeah. it. Uh, why? Pie, I mean, why wouldn't they? Of course they would pie. offer pie yeah. and funeral potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he opens his conversation with Joseph, right? They they go, he apparently gets fucking flog rod with a pie or whatever happens. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> he opens his conversation with Joseph Smith by saying, I know you're not a liar, Joseph. And I just wrote down, why? Why would he know that? Right. The only thing you know about him is that he worked on your farm and he claims to have met God and Jesus. Well, and right. he can pull a stick, pull a mean and stick. Oh, yeah. Pull obviously. a mean stick. It's yeah. like, yeah, don't worry, Basset Hound. Joey loves you. He really <laughs> loves you. And he's giving him this speech, and I'm like, I'm in my notes. I'm writing like, 
oh my God, we've had this scene 11 times. We've had this <laughs> scene where the character you're now telling this story to has told other people this fucking story. Right. <laughs> Yeah. This is a fractal. <laughs> it is once again the con clinic, though, because he's like, have you thought yep. about what I told you before? And Nathan wants to believe and he knows that Joe's not a liar. And then he apologizes to Joseph Smith for thinking that the story is too incredible to believe. It's like Joe's got his hooks in. Now he's just got to sit back and reel slowly like a big fucking halibut. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, uh, Nathan even tells him, he's like, well, you know, my ma believes in your angel visions. And he's like, really? She's not even it's like other than the dinner and the stick pulling. She hasn't met me. That's amazing. Really? Does she have any daughters? Yeah. She's <laughs> really desperate to matter in the movie. So, yeah, yeah. 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 right, saying. right, right. All right. So then we cut to dinner at the Steed house where, where dad is pointing out how terrible Joseph Smith is and how dumb Mormon is. Look, <laughs> this movie is boring and all of the scenes are terrible, but Papa fucking Liam Neeson for the rest of this movie is fucking awesome. Yeah. Because it will be every everyone in this movie will be watching for the ace in the three card money and he'll be like, Why would he be out here if you can win? Why would he be out this? <laughs> He would be playing regular cards where the odds are better if he was playing an actual game of chance. You're all idiots. You're all, I'm going to die in 14 seconds of the rickets. I hate you all. Yeah, I'm yeah. playing solitaire. It was just so crazy listening to everybody at the table because it's just this, oh, we know him. He's charming. He's handsome. He's gentlemanly. He's much nicer than Darcy is. And this is why we like him so much. And then I'm like, oh, shit, that's the wrong book. <laughs> <laughs> but well, and they're, and they're all like, you know, but we know Joseph Smith. He isn't crazy. We know that. And it's like, well, that's, yeah, dinner with him once. Yeah, it's not how crazy yeah. works. But also, he could also be a lying piece of fucking shit. He's just really yeah. good at yeah. it. Right? There's also, you guys didn't explore that. And then he adds on to that. He doesn't have to be lying. You ever heard of being deluded? It's like, right? yeah, he's a liar, lunatic, or lord. I mean, it's a pretty sufficient trichotomy yeah. to describe Joseph <laughs> Smith, right? Well, yeah, and, and, and liars and lunatics, by the way, we can confirm the existence of. Those things are things that exist <laughs> right. in the world that we all know of. I love to dad at this point. He goes, well, okay, all right, all right. Maybe the devil is pretending to be an angel in a pillar of light to lure Joseph Smith away from God. And I'm like, okay, all right, there is a worse argument than no, all no, right. Joseph Smith is correct. <laughs> and, and nobody asked Joey, did you shake his hand? See, yeah. See? they should have done that. God. So, okay, so then we get Aunt Fucks a lot taking Lydia to see Nathan, right? Because like, she's <laughs> a like, great scene, too. <laughs> oh, oh my well, God. Uh, again, without Aunt Fucks a lot, this is a terrible scene, right? Because it's just Lydia showing up to say, I'm sorry I participated in the last scene. Will we be in a future scene together? Yes. Okay, bye. <laughs> but <laughs> it's made so much better because the entire time Aunt Fucks a lot's like, fuck it. Fuck him. Fuck him. Yeah. Fuck him. <laughs> fuck him hard. Fuck him now. <laughs> He's got a hammer. Use that. Use that. Put the hammer. I'm going to show you how to make a strap on out of that hammer. <laughs> I, honestly, the only way this scene could have been better is if Aunt Fucks a Lot was in the background of the scene, just like air humping the entire time. <laughs> yes. And the worst of it is, we are fucking halfway through this stupid movie. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. like, really? Ah, I was ready for a Bon Jovi break. Nothing <laughs> has happened yet. And okay, so I love this bit too. So Aunt Fox Lot drops her off to go see Nathan. Nathan's out, you know, chopping wood, being manly or whatever. So sister, remember the narrator uh, that Melissa? has not come up at all in this movie? Melissa takes Lydia out to see Nathan. And finally, when Lydia and Melissa are on screen together, this movie has some sexual chemistry. Yep. Yeah, right. True because that. Melissa wants to fuck with Lydia. the women. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. yes, absolutely. The two of them have more goddamn chemistry than any other two characters, with the possible exception of Hiram and Joseph in this entire movie. That like where Melissa was like, I I want to say more, but like withheld saying more, and then just like I'll I'll just I'll just leave you. I'll, I'll just leave yeah. leave you <laughs> you, leave you two to talk. I'm like you, it was it was. I just it really was, want to watch. I'll, I'll it was you. great. Yeah. I, oh, I was a big fan. Big fan she of it. She climbed a fucking tree and 
said, so, you know, the way he said, oh, are they going to do it? Is there going to be any booby <laughs> stuff? Maybe there will be booby stuff. Yeah. So she goes up to talk to him and apologize for not karate fighting all of the people in town when they said a mean <laughs> thing about Joseph Smith. Fortunately, the movie spares us that dialogue, though, right? We see him start to talk, and then we skip straight to Aunt Fucks a lot, going like, "So, did he come or what? Did you uh, she just uh, roast the, the pants?" Or? She literally roasts the movie on the ride home. She's like, "What the fuck was the point of that scene? Did you <laughs> suck his dick?" And she's like, "No, I visited him as a gentleman caller and re- resolved what might have been the tension of our romance." And she's like, "Well, then, why would the why was this scene in the movie? Why was that last scene in the movie where he yelled at you? Why is this scene happening so that you can tell me about a scene that was in the movie that everyone's watching? I hate this movie." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do love how how Aunt Fucks a lot says, "Are you going to make a choice between the brothers? Or are you going to tear this poor family to shreds by driving them out of their minds?" It's like, yeah, Lydia is eventually going to have to go through the rite of passage, stick pulling with Mama Steed. Let's <laughs> get yeah. it on, baby. Oh, there we go. I like that one. <laughs> I, I, I have to point this out too because. Auntie fucks a lot is trying to get some details out of her. You know, she's like, you know, how did it go? He's like, oh, we had a very nice talk. She's like, talk schmuck. You know, let's talk about the fucking did he touch it? What parts did you touch? What parts did he touch? And she says, and I quote, did you touch his dot 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 hand? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I love how long she she like it's like she was gauging her. She's like, did you touch his? And then she watched Lydia to see what part of her body her hand was closest. To. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Boring as shit. All right. So elsewhere, Josh and Will are plotting their golden plate. Hush. Oh, my God. Something's about to happen. Okay. okay. So this is where this movie changes directions from the villains in the movie repeat the claims of Mormonism to the villains in the movie believe Joseph Smith, <laughs> but they want to rob him and God, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> to be clear. What this movie now wants us to believe is that the villains are like, oh, no, I mean, Joseph was told where solid gold plates were. We just think it'd probably be chill for us to beat him up and take him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure God and Jesus won't mind if we right. steal the angelic plates of wisdom. <laughs> just got on the phone with Geico. Yes, no, it, it happened in situ. Yeah. Well, no, I, I don't have pictures of them at the time. <laughs> Stop crying, Jesus. So that's <laughs> So then we get Joe walking through the fucking woods at night. The bad guys are all hiding behind a bush like in a fucking cartoon. The bush oh might as well get up and follow him, right? With six feet sticking out of it under it. Yeah, this is like watching people pl- uh, in a high school play where they're hiding behind a fake yes, bush. Right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, he didn't see them? Holy they're, shit. They're right there, though. <laughs> yeah, God. Metal Gear Solid in a cardboard box that's moving <laughs> suspiciously across the floor. <laughs> is that an armadillo in there? Oh, it's probably not something that's going to kill me. And this is where you also know, see, that Joshua really is a vampire because. He's in charge. Right. Why the fuck is he in charge if he's not a vampire? Because he can see in the dark. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that, makes, that makes sense. This is also where we get our first view of the plates. Now, <laughs> oh. Mormonism likes to fuck around with these plates because if they were solid gold plates, they'd be 140 fucking pounds and they wouldn't fit in a pillowcase. Right. And he couldn't drag them home and later fight off an assailant <laughs> with them. So depending on what term you Google, they are either solid gold plates delivered by the angels or... I don't know, golden tin foil? Is tin foil believable? (laughs) (laughs) And this movie isn't sure which of those substances they're doing the apologetic for. So, like, he struggles and grunts to get him out of the tree, but then later he, like, whacks a guy in the head with him, and then he's going to skip merrily down a field with him. Yeah, Yeah, right. And the guy who he whacks on the head with him lives. He doesn't have a crushed skull. Oh, no, yeah. I, I just I love as they're setting up the big ambush before the attack and everything. The, the music is pretty sure that the fucking nine riders of Mordor on his tail or right or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But the fucking movie is placing it like the Keystone cops are after it. Right. Yes. They attack Joe. Of course, Joe is the Vin Diesel of this movie. Ain't nobody gets the drop on Joe. So we literally watch 
Like, like imagine if Christians did this where, where, where like every time you saw Jesus, he had to beat everybody in the room at Canasta or something and then kick somebody's <laughs> ass. But Joseph Smith beats up two men who got the jump on him in the dark. Right. <laughs> and you. we should point out this is the softened version of the story. The original story, as told by Joseph Smith, is then I used my force field powers on them. So <laughs> even the people making the fucking nine book, three movies so far, series of the work and the glory are like, we should leave out that crazy lie Jill told for a bunch of years where he had force powers, right? Where he fucking <laughs> picked people up like the fucking Jean Grey and threw them around the fields of Palmyra, New York. <laughs> I was so sad. My notes all leading up to this jumping where they're going to do the magic power story. They're going to do the magic power story. And then they did. Yeah. Oh, Fun fact. Fun fact, and our, the ex Moors, and of course Bryce will know this, and Shannon as well will know this. He tried to use his magic powers from this story right before he was murdered. Yeah, yep. <laughs> right. He told that lie so many times that someone was like, "All right, I'm going to shoot you," and he was like, "Me, me, 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 all right, so so Joseph gets away. He runs off. Now, Lydia has gone to tell Nathan and Pa Steed that Josh was going to jump Joe that night. So they show up at the Smith house to, you know, apologize, I guess, on behalf of Josh and make sure that Joseph Smith's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Joseph Smith comes in and his hair is wet, but nothing else is. <laughs> You're right. That's fucking weird. <laughs> Why yep. isn't your coat wet? You should be dripping. <laughs> and his head is really wet. It is. Real, real well, well, and he's going on and on and on about, yeah, I got him and, and I hit him away and everything in front of 10 million people. And I was like, uh, so you now trust Posty too? Uh, You're right. Yeah. On? Right. Cause he's like, yeah, I got my, I got these gold plates right here in my fucking hands. I don't, you know, yeah. everything will be fine. Yeah. Well, Mama Steed is pretty hot. Yeah. And, and to be clear, Papa Steed does not go, oh, you know, I've actually been doubting your whole origin story. You just in front of me said you have them. Right. Can I take a peek? Right. Oh, he yeah. <laughs> He's just like, well, it's, it's, I'm far too busy being mad at my son to ask you for yeah. any proof of the thing you just said. Right. So, right. yeah, I'm here to tell you my angry vampire son is the one who attacked you in case you <laughs> didn't already know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's like, yeah, no, I mean, he talked while he was attacking me. We know each other. I did the remember yeah. the stick pulling thing. That was us. It was me and yeah. him. Yeah. So we stick pulled for the treasure. It was I the whole know. Thing. I know <laughs> the feel of his hands when they crush yeah, against right? my face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but Pa, Hiram, and Nathan all go off looking for Josh, looking to to give him a good talking to for trying to attack Joseph Smith and and strangle Mormonism in the cradle. And, of course, they find him at the tavern like the tavern rats that they are. Mm. Virtually every scene with Josh will take place at a goddamn saloon from here on out. Yeah, this scene yeah. is really, really stupid. Because I was like, they pointed out that Lydia tattled. Mm -hmm. And Angry Vampire is like, he still stays, you know, I'm going to marry Lydia for the rest of the book and I was, or movie. And I was like. She told on you, but dude. yeah, she clearly she told you that she didn't want you anymore because you were a thief. And yeah, the fact that you failed at the thieving probably didn't endear you to her more. Right. Yeah. I was like, dude, do you listen to anybody? OK, well, and then pause like, uh, let's take this outside. And, and Josh is like, no. And pause like, yes. And Josh is like, no. And pause like, I'm going to punch the fuck out of you. <laughs> 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 and. This is where Joshua pulls the gun on him. And it's supposed to be a tension filled scene. Like when someone <laughs> pulls a gun in modernity, except he's pulled an old timey gun. And I'm just writing in my notes, dude, that's an old timey gun. It's going to take him four and a half hours to load that thing, let alone shoot you with it. You could kick his ass twice before it, fires. it might as well be Heath's blunderbuss. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and the safety was on. Yeah. And he's not even pointing it at his dad. It's pointing to the side of him. And I'm like, did you just not see right? Or like, what is this? What? Okay. But yeah, but that's how we know he's all the way bad. And 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 I gotta say, honestly, as bland as all this has seemed to us, I feel like the Mormons need a second to catch their breath after something <laughs> very nearly happened. So we're gonna take a break there. But let me give Act Three the hard sell first here. Will Josh's beard fill out in time? Can these filmmakers bring themselves to show what the translating process might have looked like? 
is this what unbuttered toast would look like if it was a movie? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the pedestrian conclusion of The Work and the Glory. Hey, Noah, you remember that conversation we were having earlier about your breath? Yeah. Well, it's time to have the other end of that conversation. The one about about your breath? No, man, the one about your other end. Oh, is this a Tushy ad? Sure is. Tushy is the modern bidet company, and it washes away even the messiest of poops, leaving you with a better clean than toilet paper. Wow, is messiest of poops really in the copy? It, it, word for word. It even says discuss your worst poop experience and how Tushy could have helped. Wow. Is that why Eli's off? The entire vacation was constructed in response to that ad copy, yes. Yeah. But think about it, Noah. If you got poop on your arm, would you just wipe it away with a dry napkin? How would I get poop on my arm? You work with Eli. Oh, okay, yeah. It's weird how he's here even when he isn't. Right? Anyway, Tushy is the modern bidet for people who poop. Just poop, wash, and pat dry. I absolutely love the bidet they sent us. It gives you a better wash, and it's most soothing for your ass. Plus, it was easy to install. It attaches to the toilet in under 10 minutes, and there's no electricity or plumbing required. And as if that's not enough, it saves you money by cutting toilet paper usage by 80%, and using that much less paper is eco-friendly, too. Is that all? That is not all. Tushy has a full product line to help make the restroom the best room, including the Tushy Ottoman, the sleekest toilet stool designed to help you poop at 100% 100% of the time. Toilet stool. That's good. That's a good one. <laughs> right. And you can start washing with a Tushy bidet now just by going to hellotushy.com slash awful to get 10% off plus free shipping. This is a special offer to our listeners at hellotushy.com slash awful for 10% off. Wow, that's a great deal. And once you buy and install your Tushy, show it off. Tag us and at Hello Tushy on Instagram. I'm sorry, did you just ask people to send us pictures of their toilets? A, it's in the copy, and B... I'm not the one who had to check it. Oh, well played. Yeah, you bet your squeaky clean ass it was. Well, if it ain't Joseph Smith. Oh, hello, fellows. Nice night. What you got in the sack, Joe? Uh, uh nothing. Really? Because it looks like 140 pounds of solid gold plates. Nope, nope, nope. Just, uh, just my farming stuff. I mean, look, Joe, I'm not even clear how you managed to pull that out of a hole in the ground and carry it several miles to your house. But, it's, uh, it's a it's God magic or or not, because I don't have the plates. Oh, yeah. Wait, 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 wait let me see. Wait, no, no, no. Those back. are mine. No, I, Grab them. Mine. Bye, bye. Uh, oh. Joe, those are metal dildos. If you guys just say those will grow plates, you can have a state the borders, Utah. Why would anyone want that? No. Yeah. Dog oh, beans. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action eight months after that last scene with Martin. What's his name? Uncle Vern. Yeah. <laughs> right up on <laughs> Pa Steed. This is where he explains that he just got back from helping Joe Smith translate his golden plates. <laughs> oh, okay movie i get it i get it you want to skip over that part good yeah, for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. oh i just got over uh i was just translating these golden plates and me and bill gates were riding on a plane with our friend jeffrey epstein <laughs> yeah <laughs> right well and, and again like fucking posty just standing over the three card monty game and he goes oh did you see the place he's like no there was a curtain but i he wanted to show them to me he this is their <laughs> fucking movie yep. they didn't have and to then, bring this shit up oh my god then 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 uncle Vern shows up the characters manuscript. oh god the I was, oh my god i was howling with laughter at this moment can we can we talk about the provenance of this this manuscript just very briefly oh please do okay so this this actually happened martin harris was skeptical and wanted to test joseph smith so he's like hey i want to take the gold plates to somebody who can verify that they are what you say they are and joe was like nah mm -hmm. and he's like i gotta have something and joe's Angels like here's a piece of paper with mm -hmm. what the characters look like and they show the camera has an angle on the character's manuscript and you can see it. 
And I put a picture of it in the show notes here so our panelists can see what we're looking at here. Now, <laughs> this happened. Martin Harris oh, took a so manuscript this to a guy so named dumb. Podcast Listener. This is like an 11 year old trying to do this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. It is twins who made up a language, the thing that started a religion. It's so silly. <laughs> it's like tally marks and numbers and H's and fours with extra lines. It's, and it's a birthday just cake. A, yeah. a birthday cake as well. Oh, there is. I didn't see a the D, birthday just cake. Just a fucking D. And there's some wiggles and there's some An spoons. H, a fancy H. Apparently this language had 750 fucking letters. It must be pictographic. <laughs> An M at one point. It's there's just an M, and he's like, "Fuck, did an M," <laughs> <laughs> and then he put a dot underneath it. Oh, yeah. do you, do you guys see the big calligraphy H over here? Like, come on, oh, yeah. give me a yeah. fucking break, man. Yeah, fancy H. <laughs> now there is there is a meme circulating the ex Mormon subreddit that is like some people believe Joseph Smith translated the gold plates from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Others are skeptical of it. And it's all written with letters that come from this manuscript. Amazing. <laughs> it's fucking amazing. Anyway, wow. so this actually happened, right? Martin Harris went to this guy, Professor Anthon. Professor Anthon was one of the professors at Columbia who was caught up in Egyptomania because, you know, the Rosetta Stone had been discovered yeah. and was in the process of being discovered. Everybody was super interested in ancient Egypt. Joseph Smith included. So he showed this piece of paper, not this exact one, a different one, to Charles Anthon. And what we have is Joseph Smith's version of this story. And that's what the movie portrays, that Martin Harris went to him and said that these are true Egypt Egyptian characters. These. The things we're looking at right these, here. That we're looking yeah. at. I don't know if you've seen Egyptian hieroglyphics. The, the as it says here, Care actors, yeah, the care actors here. <laughs> now, we have Joseph Smith's side of the story. We don't have Martin Harris's side of the story because he never told it. But we do have Charles Anthon's side of the story. Matches up exactly with, uh, with Joseph Smith's, I'm sure, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is what Charles Anthon says. He describes the, the story that, that Martin Harris told him of how the plates came about. And he says, on hearing this odd story, I changed my opinion about the paper and instead of viewing it any longer as a hoax upon the learned because he thought that Martin Harris was there just to make a, like make him the butt of a joke, he says, I began to regard it as part of a scheme to cheat the farmer of his money. And I communicated my suspicions to him, warning him <laughs> to beware of rogues. He requested an opinion from me in writing, which, of course, I declined giving, and he then took his leave carrying the paper with him. This paper was, in fact, a singular scrawl, and then he describes it, so on and so forth. Greek and Hebrew letters, crosses and flourishes, Roman letters inverted or placed sideways, which is kind of what we're looking at here. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, he says there's a Mexican calendar given by Humboldt, but copied in such a way as not to betray, betray the source whence it was derived. I am thus particular as to the contents of the paper, inasmuch as I have frequently conversed with my friends on the subject since the Mormonite excitement began, and well remember that the paper contained anything else but Egyptian hieroglyphics, end quote. <laughs> and the reason that we have that account is because the Mormon missionaries were telling the Joseph Smith version of the story that Charles <laughs> Anthon proclaimed it real Egyptian, and he was like, hey! Hell fucking no. Wow. And he wrote that letter to be included in the first full length Mormon expose book. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Yep. Again, again, it's your fucking movie, you fucking idiots. Why bring the. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to show this. You don't. Again, it's like if we had contemporary articles to the Bible where someone was like, Yeshua was fucking fine, okay? They dragged him out of that. Then there was a back entrance to the cave. You had to go through <laughs> Maury's bagels, but you could get in there. <laughs> Just some guy taking a selfie with Jesus's corpse. See? And, you see? Now, here's the fucking thing. Here's the most fucked up thing about this story that we kind of grazed over as we were going through it, though. Like, how hard would it be to fake... Egyptian hieroglyphs like their photographs of them books of them existed yep he could have just copied random hieroglyphs out of a fucking book and he didn't do that instead he did this weird ass silly ass mess with birthday cakes and tally marks and <laughs> shit like that Jesus Christ but and, and then and fucking 
Pa Steed in the movie tells him that he's like, he's like, Martin, come on. Like he could have fucking just copied it out of a goddamn book. And even if he could, he didn't. This is just nonsense. And, and Martin's like, Oh yeah. But have you, have you thought about Pascal's wager? <laughs> well, and it's so sad. Again, I do not know why this movie gives us this information. He's like, well, I'm mortgaging my farm so that we could print the first version of his book. And he's like, Oh, is Joseph Smith mortgaging his farm to print the first version of his holy book that God commanded him to write? No, no, just no, no, no. 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 We're, no. we're doing me. mine. But you know, if we need a second edition, we'll probably do his. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. And that conflict is resolved in the next scene, too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then the fucking okay, so sis pipes up to remind us that she was the narrator the whole time, right? And catches us up on Joshua. Oh, Joshua has this is so again, it's your fucking movie, you idiots. They're like, <laughs> everybody hated Joshua, so he fled as far to the west he could where there was no law. And it's like, yeah, only crooked people would do that. Right. <laughs> Why? Oh, oh, important point though, he fled to Missouri. Yep. Yeah. Missouri's oh, an interesting choice. Specifically. Wink, wink. Yeah. Uh, oh, right, because this is a trilogy. Yeah, okay. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> because this is a trilogy based on nine historical books that want to blame what happened to Mormons in Missouri <laughs> on a guy who didn't get to fuck the lady he liked in his own town. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, so we, we, we meet up with Josh. He's playing poker at the saloon like some kind of tavern rat. And hair and makeup gave him a real fake beard this time. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. They glued some hair on his face this time, yeah. So he's playing poker. The barmaid is helping him cheat at poker, too. So he's not just really a card obviously. player. He's a card cheat, damn it. Yeah. And of course, nobody else notices. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in a lot about this scene. First of all, the system of cheating seems to be I move my pinky and that yeah. gives you information. So I want to know how, com like, is the pinky move you should bet or is the pinky move like two queens on the river? <laughs> 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 and there's one other thing about this which is that if you are playing heads up poker against someone and they start betting your businesses which are not worth the same amount of money you probably shouldn't take that bet right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're playing for like eight dollars and the guy's like hmm well based on the cars in my hand I bet you infinity dollars plus your eyeballs. I feel like you fold. I right. feel like you fold just on the off chance. What well, if the guy he wins the business off of had won? He was just going to get some guy's cart and three horses. Right. Yeah. Well, and and then of course because these idiots don't even know how this shit works, he wins with four fucking kings. The cheating wasn't that he was like. You know, just sneaking. She wasn't sneaking cars to him or anything. No. Nope. Right. Like he has to speak that you don't you got four fucking kings. You don't need to cheat. <laughs> you have four kings. Yeah, that must be what the, the pinky signal must be. You have four kings, you idiot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so you're asking me if he has four aces? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> see, you have to remember this was written and directed by Mormons and right, they have no many idea. Mormons face cards are of the devil so they don't understand <laughs> yeah to be fair any of this. We, we, we should be lucky that this scene doesn't end with pick four and skip your turn so yeah, yeah right right fair. exactly <laughs> go fish. somebody yells out yeah. uno yeah so yeah. Also, okay, so, and then we head back to Palmyra where Nathan and Lydia are entering ever closer to a little heavy petting. Oh, oh my God. They're out taking a romantic walk through the graveyard, which, I mean, yeah, that's I don't know, okay. very romantic. I mean, hell yeah. I mean, graveyards are beautiful there. Graveyards but yeah, are hot. okay. Yeah, fuck yeah, man. So, but Nathan, God, it's so convoluted back then. Nathan asks Lydia for her permission to ask her dad for his permission to marry her. Oh, the 1800s, when every romance was a middle school romance. But instead of breaking up because the eighth grade dance was coming up and you got nervous, you got married, had 11 kids, and died at 31. Right. <laughs> yep. <sighs> and the conflict in this scene is she's headed off to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And he 
is building a homestead. Yep. And we can't be together for a year. Yeah. That's it. That's that's the conflict. There's no resolution. There's no further exposition of that. She just is off to boarding school and Nathan is off to build a house. Well, because very clearly we're trying to like nod towards the source material, but the movie's like, well, we can't have, we can't do a whole fucking thing where she goes to boarding school, right? So we just get a montage of her learning and him planing wood. And, yeah. and, and Mormoning. Yes, Joseph Smith <laughs> being very, hard. very charismatic. I love, I love your notes here in this scene, Shannon. <laughs> 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 you said what we're all thinking, actually. I, uh, I was like, oh, what did I miss? What did yeah. I miss? <laughs> I like, Sorry. <laughs> Good God. But see, I was like, why wouldn't, oh, anyway, never mind. We'll get to it. <laughs> so, okay. So now Lydia has come home from boarding school to tell her dad that she will too still marry Nathan if she wants to. So now we get the scene where Nathan rides into the town and he, he runs into the shop to tell Lydia's dad what's what. And he comes in and he yells, I'll be taking your daughter, Mr. McBride. And I'm like, Nate, buddy, you had the whole fucking ride over to think of your line. Like, do you, you, you could have said that you, 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 you the workshop that with somebody before you left. I'll be taking your daughter. You sound like a fucking kidnapper, man. This guy, you, you're, yes. you're the one whose dad looks like Liam Neeson. This doesn't even make sense now. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, that is very OG Mormon of him. I'll be oh taking your daughter. <laughs> okay. All right. Actually, yeah. He's had Joe in his ear for like months. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. That might just be the Mormon movie, I'll Be Back, and I didn't know it. Yeah, right, okay. All right, they got to get it in there somewhere. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting because he's like, I had to make a good impression as they're like running out and before they smooch in the alley. It's like, well, is that a good impression? Telling a guy you're about to steal his daughter is not a good impression, bro. Yeah. And running down the alley with her, it's like, dude, no, that's not a good impression on Papa. No. It never is. No. Never no. is. Well, and then he's like, ha ha, you know, your dad can't say anything. He tried to forbid you from seeing me, but we're, we'll, we're still in love. And she's like, hold on, hold on. Are you a fucking crazy Mormon or what? Is it? Yes. Let's- <laughs> For mm-hmm. some reason, this movie chooses to add romantic tension here. This would be like if Carrie Yule was grabbed Princess Peach or whatever the fuck she was called and like <laughs> skates her across the room and she's like, I don't know, I just feel like you're very possessive when we're around our friends. Like, why? <laughs> why is the movie he has literally come in and rushed her out the door in the classic I'll be taking the girl moment and she's just like, but Joseph Smith though, right? <laughs> Joseph Smith? <laughs> I mean, Girl, I get it, but like maybe that's the letter you send before you come home to tell off dad. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is the thing, this is every Mormon's just moment of orgasm or whatever. He says religion first. Yep, he chooses he gives Mormonism her up for his religion. Yeah. Over <gasps> well, cuz Lydia's standing there going like Right, but like, why wouldn't he just be playing real cards though? The odds would be so much better that if he was cheating <laughs> with the aces. Yeah. And that's when he has the whole, no, I love you, Lydia, but I love the religion that Joseph Smith made up the year before last even more. Yup. Okay. Yeah. Look, this was painful and I once got broken up with because someone had to go to a My Chemical Romance concert that summer. (laughs) And this scene in the movie was painful for me. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. Stole my girl. My Chemical Romance. I do want to say this is basically the only point where we see the actual central conflict sharply and acutely aware in two characters. The conflict of this movie is Joseph Smith. Yep. If there is no Joseph Smith in all of this, there is absolutely no conflict. Right. And right. it's even clearer later in a couple later scenes. But the conflict is not belief in Christianity or a specific kind of Christianity, the conflict is Joseph Smith. Yep. He right. is the stakes in this movie. Yeah. There is no there is no conflict without him. And it's very clear that even the characters who are written into this in the town know that this is a cult of personality. That this is not just about the Bible. This is not just about interpretations of the Bible. This is about the figure who leads the community. 
That's the huge problem here. Well, right. The, the very next scene after that is Pa, Steed, and Martin talking about how Martin's going to mortgage his whole fucking farm for Joey's bullshit book. Yes. Yeah. And Martin has this amazing moment where he's like, do you feel I'm an honest man? And look, it's a Mormon <laughs> movie, so he's like, you're an honest man. But I wanted so badly for him to be like, no, Martin, but you're stupid, dude. <laughs> right? You're stupid. Did you see the characters? One of them was just an M, man. It was just an M. <laughs> One of them was a birthday cake, and he went back. He used that like three times, a birthday cake. <laughs> yes. Of course, I was sitting there the whole time thinking, why is Pa Steed wearing a maternity shirt? Right. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I cared about. Because they're point. cozy, Shannon. Check you're not having a big tummy like you're always pregnant, <laughs> privilege, Shannon. <laughs> like he wears that the whole rest of the movie. I was like, is he trying to tell us something? Okay. <laughs> all right. So and then in the tradition of this fucking film, the next scene is two of the characters talking about the last fucking scene god fuck you ma and pa are now talking about the fact that martin is gonna mortgage his farm to buy the to print the book that shit like we're we're five layers into telling us what already happened now yes right yep. but we do need to make dad unreasonable here so he's going to give every argument except a good one for why they can't be mormon <laughs> yes. it's like um it's because joseph smith has used magic mind control on him uh, I will punch her son in the face and I own you. Those are my arguments. That yep. is why you shouldn't be more. Oh, I love too, the whole idea that like they, they actually set the juxtaposition up so that like, oh, if only he was more progressive on feminism, he would, like the <laughs> wife would be allowed to be a Mormon. If only it wasn't for the fact that the other religions treated women so poorly then she would be able to follow her heart and be a Mormon. <laughs> yeah. I love oh the point God. that she makes here too, because she talks about Martin Harris mortgaging his farm. And then he says, he hasn't given the money to Joseph. He's given it to the printers. Joseph won't see a penny of it. And my thought is, until he sells a copy of the book. Well, right. It yeah. was printed without his money. That's right. how a book works. <laughs> a, even if you're giving it away, if you're then starting a church with it, it doesn't fucking matter. Look, <laughs> man, if somebody like bought all my food for me for two months, he didn't hand me the money either, but it helps. <laughs> it sure fucking helps. Noah won't see a penny of those hot pockets. <laughs> yeah. <right>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we we check back in with Josh, who is, you guessed it, in a saloon. Okay, the only point of this scene is for him to find out that Lydia is going to marry his brother, except, and it's boring and stupid, except it contains truly the funniest interaction in the movie. <laughs> the, like, henchman guy is like, <laughs> oh, she and your brother. And he pauses and, like, trails off. And then Joshua goes, what about him? And I'm like... What do you think, man? They're going to duel at sunrise. No, they're getting married. <laughs> like, what about them? They made a human centipede. That's what happened, Joshua. Oh you missed a lot in the year you've been gone. <laughs> oh, like any of this should have even been a surprise to him. Yeah, right. And this is the only character with period correct teeth. Yes. Just choose a goddamn century and stick with it. Yeah. Right. Fuck! Why? So why? Well, because Ugh. only bad guys have bad teeth. That's a that's a fucking <laughs> yeah. hard and fast rule. If it isn't a Coen Brothers movie, in which case you can be an extra and have bad teeth. Only bad guys have bad teeth. In American film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. British film, yeah. everybody yeah. has bad no, teeth. No, that's fair. Okay. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Nathan, now he's got his own land, he's got his own house, but we have a scene where he comes to see he comes to the old family house to show Ma this brand new book of Mormon he's got. Mm. Oh, this scene is so stupid. Okay, look, the whole point of this is Mom's going to read the book of Mormon. She's going to check in with her heart that her time was wasted if she read Alma and it's not the true religion. So now <laughs> she's a Mormon, right? That's the point of this scene. But because this movie has established these entirely dumb stakes of dad won't let her be a Mormon, <laughs> they've got to do like a... I'm not giving you these drugs. I'm you're buying a sticker from me and I'm giving you a gift of these things. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> right, yeah, cuz mom won't disobey her husband cuz you know like hey, you know, being Mormon is important, but 
knowing your damn role as a woman is apparently more important mm. by Mormon standards. Yeah. And but sis says, well, you know what? Technically, dad never said I couldn't have an ukbe of Mormon maize. So <laughs> I think we found ourselves <laughs> our loophole. Right. Yes. And to sister's credit here, he's like, yeah, see, that works for everyone. And then he turns to her and he's like, are you going to read it? And she's like, oh, <laughs> fun. you the know, whole, such a crazy week. I got to go chicken the chicken. It's a very long <laughs> book and it doesn't look like it's very easy. I hear there are submarines. Those seem fun. <laughs> it wouldn't. It wouldn't. That's They're all great tight material. like a dish. Oh, no, I got to read the pearl. I got to read the pearl of great price to get the submarines. No, I'm not going to read it. No. All right. <laughs> They're just boats. Don't waste a year of your life, people. They're just boats in the main book. No, there's a submarine in the book. The there's submarines are in, in the main book. ether. They're yep. in ether. Yep. The book, book of ether. ether. The book that puts you to sleep. Uh, yeah. By the way, yes, exactly. The most boring goddamn thing that exists in the universe. I was high for a lot of that book. So, yeah, really. so, <laughs> it's probably Bryce's fault, you know. Um. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Allegedly. Oh, you Resist said probably. Here. No, we're good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I did. Yeah. I worked it out. So, okay. So Nathan is out building his house all manly like, right? He's always chopping fucking wood or plain and wood whenever we see him. And Pa comes to visit to have a talk about this Book of Mormon shit. And of course, the dad has to be unreasonable about everything and he has to have great arguments for everything. So he's like, he actually goes with the, but Pa, didn't your daddy die so we'd all have the freedom to oh. be Mormon if we wanted to? <laughs> oh this white actor has been watching black actors give the you're a bigot speech to other white actors his whole life. He was so psyched to do it. He was like, a man like you comes down on a man like me. And I was like, okay, Cracker Barrel. And he's just like, <laughs> I believe the stars and stripes. And I'm just like, good for you, kiddo. That improv class at BYU paid the fuck off. <laughs> And he he ends this scene by saying, I used to be proud to be a steed. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Ooh, apparently oh, pride gosh. isn't hereditary in this family. It also, it just weirdly is the trick that everyone in this family uses in the movie. Like, everyone's having a different conversation than someone's like, uh, I hate this family. Tag, tag in, tag in. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Oh, I hate this. Oh, fuck, fuck. No, you already said it. It doesn't make no, sense. No, fuck dad. I... Oh, I'm back oh, in. Okay. All right. All right. So. Yes, yes. All right. So, okay. And now Nathan, he busts out his letter written box for a nice, sad voiceover as he writes to Lydia. Dearest Lydia, if you just read the entire Book of Mormon <laughs> and see it's not real, I'll totes my goats leave you alone. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, no, he, he writes her a love letter and wraps it around a book of fucking Mormon. Huh? God, I was like, you know, Basset Hound, you are truly a Mormon. You are only happy with people making a choice when they make your choice. I mean, this is so stupid and it's boring as fuck. Can we have a plot line, please? Well, that's the one thing that I wanted to get to is like he wraps up the letter and there's like this sense of urgency about it that he has to give this package to his sister, Melissa, who then delivers it to Lydia. And it's like, I really sure hope she gets her Book of Mormon before it's too late. Nothing happens. Right. <laughs> exactly. Time's ticking on the nothing clock. Right. Of course, I don't. Yeah. It is as though he is aware there are only a few minutes left in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> there are eight minutes left. And this yeah. is the conflict that we're getting. Well, it's sort of. Yeah, right. Because because a sis goes to the shop and she, he's like, excuse me, shop owner. Can you make sure that your daughter gets this? And he's like, sure, sure. Who's it from? And she's like, uh, uh, Nathan uh, uh, Hats. Nathan Hats. Steed. Steed. Steeple. Is this day Nathan? It's a Statham Needs. That's yeah. it. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, but he realizes it's a gift from a steed, so he throws it in the trash. And I'm sorry, but the slow motion. Book of Mormon thudding <laughs> into the trash oh. on top of coffee grounds. Were they coffee grounds or rat droppings? I couldn't tell. So, yeah. Let's go with rat droppings. It was so <laughs> dramatic and amazing because, of course, that's a moment that all Mormons share, right? You gave a Book of Mormon to somebody and then watched them throw it in the 
Throw it into trash. rat droppings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I bought my Mormon Starbucks. They didn't come back because I asked them questions about horses, but I bought them Starbucks. <laughs> well, that's probably why they didn't come back right there. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the Starbucks, yeah. <laughs> so that night, Nathan's moseying through town, and who should show up but his outlaw tavern rat brother, Joshua. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is so... <sighs> There are so many plot holes by this point. It's like it, it, trying to walk on the plot itself is like trying to stay on a single thread of a net. It, it's impossible to do. How did Joshua know that he was there? When, when, when was the conflict actually supposed to take place prior to this so that there was actual real conflict in what we're about to? No, no, none of that. It's just, oh, Nathan is walking through town at night with the big bag of rice because who the fuck cares? And Joshua shows up and they get in a fight. Right. And, and Nathan immediately tries to run away from him. Why? That's the thing. I'm not telling, I'm not saying that there are not holes in the script. I'm saying there are not plot holes in the script, right? How can there be <laughs> holes in the plot? Right. Exactly. If you don't have a blanket, there are no holes in that blanket. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, and then to make it even dumber, Josh shows up. He's about ready to whip Nathan's ass. Lydia fucking leaps out of a goddamn tree like a ninja and <laughs> pulls a gun on Josh and says, no, you'll not have your way. And it's like, when the fuck did anything happen that would justify any of this from anyone? OK, so here's the thing. The only possible explanation is okay. that Nathan and Lydia were doing some nice, friendly CNC role play. She was supposed to pull the gun on him, and then he was going to do <laughs> mouth stuff to her in that alley. I get it. I've been there. <laughs> and then Joshua showed up and really fucked it up for everybody. Yeah, right. Like, now I have to improvise. I will say one other thing about this scene is Nathan, and look, we've seen some bad fight choreography. Nathan yeah. reacts to the stomach punch before Jonathan <laughs> throws it. So he, do he does a little like hop oof and then the actor playing Jonathan like moves his arm real quick. He's like, yeah, I got you with one of those time delayed punches. <laughs> it, was the, it was the force thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's yeah. it. <laughs> it did show up. Yeah, because like, yeah, she pulls the gun, tussle, tussle. Now she runs off and Nathan has the gun, but he can't bring himself to shoot Josh. And once again, god damn it, the actor only quarter cocks the gun. It's on safety, you fucking idiots. Cock the goddamn <laughs> gun all the way. But also oh, fuck. So at this so he pulled Nathan has the gun. Josh runs off, not to be seen again in the film. But we cannot ignore the exchange there because at the end, Josh is holding the gun to Nathan's or no, sorry, Nathan is holding the gun to Josh's face, and he says, I don't hold any malice and pulls the gun back. And Joshua, like, shoves him on the ground and says, I do, and then runs away. And then that's the end. Yeah. And the yeah. movie, the movie is so sure that that was a good line. It's like, I don't hold any malice. And he's just like, fuck you. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, but stupid. There's you nothing. Got stupid There's no lies. Brother, you're I hate you. face oh is ugly. And okay. So now we check back in on the Steed household. Everybody sure is worried about Pa, right? Because he's acting... I, he's he's been bummed ever since he had that exchange with Nathan where Nathan point out that grandpappy died so we could all be Mormon if we wanted. He's just been bummed ever since then, right? Yeah. I think he's doing shrooms. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Honestly, that's a better explanation for his complete overhaul of opinion in this scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, right, because they, the way they keep describing him, they're like, you know, we I was out there talking to him for an hour yesterday and it's like he didn't even notice. And I'm like, all right, well, then he's dead. Like, he died <laughs> sitting up. That happens sometimes. The eyes don't close till you close them sometimes. Is he breathing? Yeah. It's that great thing with terrible writing where people make the time too long, right? Where they're like, I remember he was out at the lake for four hours yesterday just staring in the distance. And it's like, I'm sorry, four hours? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 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 and you were talking to him the whole time and you didn't get a response? What were you talking That's about? That's an audiobook, bro. Were you reading the fucking Book of Mormon? <laughs> <laughs> but this is the big change of heart, right? This is where he says his feelings towards Joseph haven't changed, but he's not going to tell his wife what to believe in. Right. She can read right. the Book of Mormon. 
Well, it's weird because he's like, look, I barely forge. I'm not sure about this Joseph Smith, but you can read the Book of Mormon, get baptized, go to his church and take our children. And I was like, well, geez, I'd hate to see what you're into if you are sure about Joseph Smith. <laughs> <laughs> he's a dead I-, I guess I know what he is going to let him do when yeah, he's sure right, about well, yeah. it. <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> Melissa's about married age. <laughs> so, yep, yep. All right. So, yeah. So, Joseph Smith has started the first Mormon church now. And Nathan is going to pick up the whole family to to head on upstate for a weekend to go check them out, right? He has to have his aw shucks, I forgive you conversation with Paul. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we get, I'm going to call this the Heath Enright School of I Love You's here at the end of the scene. <laughs> 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 she's allowed to go and the daughter who's been narrating this movie in case you forgot turns around she's like I love you dad oh shit uh, dad dad did you hear me I dad, said dad did you hear me actually <laughs> let me stop the wagon dad I love you I, you're looking right at me it's so awkward my- <laughs> babe wait wait babe wait wait and dad's like I love spending time <laughs> at the farm <laughs> It's so awkward. It's like it's such an absolute fuck you to this daughter. It is. And then once they're all the way off, he goes, I like you too. (laughs) Now, can we talk about Ma's hat pin? (laughs) <laughs> I was, oh, I was hoping oh that we my would. God. We could pull sticks with that fucking hat pin. It was the hell of a long hat pin. I mean, hat pins in that time period were actually only about six to eight inches long, and they'd usually use two to hold the hat in. And the sharp end often poked right into your scalp if somebody else was putting it in. I mean, they were awesome weapons against sexual harassment, too. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I'm like, Ma Steed knows she's heading towards the cane of sexual harassment <laughs> because she stuck a fucking sword pin into that. Oh, that thing no is like two and a half feet long. I was like, this is sticking so far out the other side. She could poke her son's eye out just by leaning over to talk to him. I was like, <laughs> lean over just a little more, two more inches, two more inches. You can give him a scar. She's like, you know, I know I might have to take out Joseph and Hiram together. I'll I'll pin their oh heads together God. like a fucking shish kebab. Yeah, hell yeah, man. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, I want that hat pin. God. Damn it. Uh, and before they depart, too, this is the first time, apparently, that Nathan has seen his younger sisters for a while, and he's like, whoa, gonna have to build a fence around you two just to keep Joseph Smith away. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. There was a very awkward, like, wow, you guys sure are fuckable, huh? Yep. Huh? Yeah. Got a moment. Yep. Yep. So now they're heading out of town, but before they can go, this is so goddamn weird. Melissa, the narrator sister, has something she's got to do in town. So she says, you know, drive the wagon slow. I'll catch up. So she's going <laughs> to run at wagon speed as she does yeah. all her stuff. Uh, honestly, if Melissa had just been like panting and out of breath and throwing up because of a runner's <laughs> workout. <laughs> oh, my God. Horses are so fast. Did you know how fast horses are? <laughs> even when they're pulling shit it turns out oh, once they get the momentum you know but on wheels. I, I want to point out that this is how convoluted and stupidly written this movie is right what we need to happen is we need Lydia to find out that Nathan who's in the movie nay my friends on the cart that Melissa is getting off right we need to find out that Nathan gave her the book and her dad threw it away. So she's going to read the book and she's going to love him after all. But because this was written by someone making their way through a rat's maze of the English language, Melissa runs into town, tells Lydia, hey, did you get that package that I left with your dad? No, I bet he threw it out somewhere around here. Okay, bye. I got to go catch up to horses. (laughs) All right. No, no, no. It's even dumber than that, right? Because... Again, it's the writers not knowing how time works, right? She says, look, you know, I gave you that package a week ago and you never sent a a reply to Nathan. And she's like, wait, a package a week ago? I never got it. Oh, your dad must have thrown it away. And then she goes digging through the trash, which apparently they keep last week's rat droppings around for a while. Yeah. Right. Because She finds it in that trash can. Right. Well, you know, they they were doing one of those recycling programs and you had to throw all your plot trash into that particular can. (laughs) And then the green bin is the bottles. They were very forward thinking in the 1820s. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Yellow bin is the compost. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
So, yeah, so she reads his letter and he's got a Bible quote in the letter and she goes and checks and it's one of the lovey ones, not one of the I'm going to chop you into pieces and mail you to all of my different (laughs) friends passages, which is. Oh, I was really hoping for an Ezekiel quote. I was like, come on, you coward. Do it. Do it. (laughs) (laughs) I was just yeah, I was like the garbage was incredibly clean and everything. But I was like, okay. She's in there going, I learned something there in Boston. And I was like, how to think for myself and all that shit. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, God. so you want to go be Mormon where you can't think for yourself and everything? <laughs> if you do, you get slapped down just because you have a vagina? Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, and, and of yeah. course, it's so goddamn stupid because like they've, they've sort of forced the situation where she gets to have the whole, but I was educated in a fancy school and I know how to think better than you guys, so I'm Mormon now. It's like, really? Is that how it works? That people who no. are more educated are more likely to <laughs> no, be Mormon? No. <laughs> mm-hmm. She goes, you know, you guys are awfully intolerant of this religion that won't accept black people until 1978. <laughs> <laughs> and still doesn't accept women. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, God. to this fucking day. But yeah, so she storms off to go be Mormon. Yeah. And that's when Joe starts his church. And then it does kind of like this musical montage where Joe's baptizing a bunch of folks and like she's going and visiting the shithole podunk place that she's choosing instead of her like lavish life with her rich family and then like they do a cute little scripture exchange well okay oh, so adorable so yeah so he gets home from the new mormon church and he finds a little note that she's left with a quote from ruth and he runs in to check it and see if it's the drunken hand job part but it's not it's not <laughs> i was gonna part. say <laughs> if i came home and my wife left me a quote from ruth there's a coin flips chance i'm getting laid tonight I yeah right I exactly. Exactly. Right. i'm like oh let me go lay naked in some hay let me get some drink <laughs> in me and go lay but naked no, in it, some- <laughs> hey, you want to uncover my feet um it's the uh incestuous mother-in-law daughter-in-law porn Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so he checks the Bible quote. He sees it's a good one and he turns around and she's there and she tells him she read the whole Book of Mormon and it's not evil at all. It's all the other negative words, but not evil. (laughs) (laughs) She says, I want to believe Nathan and I wanted her so badly to be like, it's just it's got horses in it, dude. You know, there weren't (laughs) horses. (laughs) Elephants. He elephants made a too. sword just by looking at what <laughs> he looked at iron long enough to learn how to smelt it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> he smelted it with his mind powers. Or it must have been. <laughs> oh, and then oh. the two of them kiss as though they were both gay and trying to fool their parents in a farce. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> And then it's like, that's the end, right? Because there's like happy music, happy smiles, happy people with no chemistry trying to smooch convincingly happy scenery yep. and happy barns because why the fuck not and that's it that's the whole movie well yeah sister narrator comes up and she says and i sure hope one day i'd grow up and fuck somebody as hot as lydia anyway i'm pretty sure everything's <laughs> gonna be really good for mormons from here on out <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what, we're recording a little later than Eli normally stays up ever since baby times have come to him. So uh, I think we got to wrap up quickly, but I do have to thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Shannon, for hanging out with us. It's been a blast. If our listeners want to hear more from you, where should they go? Glass Thoughts Podcast. You can find us on Patreon and you can also find us on anywhere where podcasts live and come and listen to us. We're we're funny. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Do you want a little, <laughs> know a little bit about the, more about the Mormon uh, the Exmo lifestyle is a great place to check in. Of course, we'll have links on the show notes. And well, that does it for our review of the work and the glory. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to Mormonize this month even further. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. The fighting preacher, Noah. Uh, you're not Eli. Get ahead, Noah. Right. Yes. Oh, get ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that to look forward to. <clears throat> My audio signature didn't change over mid-sentence like I expected. One more time. All right. Well, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode, I think, 316 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing A, The Citation A, The D&D Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast 
podcast are provided by the law offices of P.A. Edward Torres. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot and Evil Traps on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright, Eli Bostic, I'm No Illusions, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Melissa got a welded chain, two oxen, and a long pole. <laughs> she pried the stumps out properly and then escaped to Canada, where she changed her name to Melissa Trudeau. Fuck yes, she did. <laughs> Statistically speaking, Joseph Smith eventually fucked Lydia. <laughs> Eight years later, Joshua was murdered by Porter Rockwell. Also, Heath and I pulled sticks at the next atheist conference. I let him win. <laughs> This movie is part of a trilogy, so Bryce and Shannon are going to be talking about these characters for a long, long time. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's Uh, scam for fuck you, apparently, by the way. Bringing anyone on for movie one of a trilogy is our way of saying (laughs) fuck you. That's right. Like it was planned. Oh, God. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.